Um, yeah, and I remember one of the assignments that that my lecturer gave us was she sent us one of those links to like Quran Explorer. And our assignment was to listen to some recitations of the Quran and talk about how it would make a believing Muslim feel. So I just went to the beginning of the Quran and started listening to it. And obviously that had me roped into about two and a half hours of recitation of Surah Al-Baqarah. The first time you listen to Quran, you just listen to the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah. Yep. I knew listening to the Quran from the first Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I knew it would change my life. Just from listening to the Quran, I knew about 10 pages of Surah Al-Baqarah, but I'd, I'd never... <laughs> 10 bit of, by heart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, 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 learn, I'd, mem I'd memorized my first hizb at that point, before I'd even like taken my shahad in, in the masjid. <laughs> yeah. Um... Guys, the Football World Cup is right around the corner, and it's the hottest ticket in town. I always wanted to use that phrase, and I'm really glad that the time has arrived. So with everybody excited about the World Cup, I have some quite astounding news for those with tickets. If you're planning to head to the FIFA World Cup 2022, but can't seem to get accommodation because most of the places are completely sold out, don't you worry. Why? Because Bright Sun Travel has teamed up with the Saudi Tourism Authority to help you stay in Saudi Arabia during the World Cup and commute to Doha. Now, Saudi, I hear you ask, but the World Cup is in Doha. I'm glad you asked. Well, Saudi is just over an hour flight to Doha, about the same as an average daily commute. I bet you didn't know that. And so what you can do is you can stay in Saudi Arabia, explore Saudi Arabia, enjoy Saudi Arabia with all the amazing things you can do there. And then for match day, head over to Doha on a quick commute and watch the match and then come back. And Bright Sun, they're making it easy for you. You can look at affordable packages by going to btpilgrimages.com forward slash football or click the link in the description. Now, Bright Sun Travel also do Umrah packages. And if, for example, you want to go to Umrah, but you don't have a group to go with, then Bright Sun Travel can connect you and help you go with a group that's already going. Now, what are the advantages of going with the group? I hear you ask. Well, first of all, you can get a more affordable package and often that's with more comfort. And also you can meet some other individuals who are on the same trip of, as you, a life-changing trip, I might add. So if you're interested in that, just call 0203-411-5020 or if you're an internet guy, then you can email groups at brightsun.co.uk. Brightsun can also advise you on visa requirements, COVID requirements, and so on and so forth. So you can just be at ease. Brightsun are also giving freshly grounded listeners special curated officer officers. No, sir. Sir, I'm going to need you to step down. Offers uh, where you can go to Saudi, go to World Cup, and also enjoy many of the other things that you could do for example in Saudi they can kind of curate a package for you and that is all at Bright Sun and guess what they're throwing in free airport transfers just for us the tribe if you're interested in booking accommodation for the World Cup and or booking a trip to Saudi you can visit btpilgrimages.com forward slash football that's bravo let's test it now because you're testing me what oh you think I studied criminology and learnt my my phonetic alphabet is that what it's called my you think i don't know my alpha bravio romeo you're gonna test me if you're interested go to bravo tango i don't know peter india lima golf romeo india mike alpha golf echo sierra dot com forward slash foxtrot oscar oscar tango Bravo, Alpha, Lima, Lima. Yeah? Now let's get to the episode. And welcome to a freshly grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to freshly grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? I... Welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by... And after that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? Assalamu alaikum, Sam. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for having me, Brother Faisal. 
No, you, I meant to say thank you for coming on first. You ruined it now. <laughs> now I have. You're very oh, welcome. Yeah. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure. It's a different Sam than perhaps people you normally used to on Freshly Guarded, um, but uh, just as just as uh, happy to have you on. Alhamdulillah, uh, Sam. I think it's been in some ways like uh, it's been in the pipeline for a long time. Just I suppose like I was saying when we when we met when we first ever met last week um, <laughs> that. Uh, uh, perhaps we've been on each other's radars for a while, but never really actually like connected um, or had the chance to connect properly. So it's it's really nice to have you on. And for some reason, I feel like I've known you for ages, even though we only just met last week. Alhamdulillah. You know, I've, I think I've been fishing for an opportunity to uh, have a conversation with you at some point for a little while. It's kind of been on and off my radar. Some of my students have said to me, subhanAllah, Sam, you would be the best ever uh, guest on, uh, on Freshly Round. And I said, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, know, I don't know what I don't know what Faisal is playing at. He's had Silverback AJ on twenty times. He's had Sudden Remedies on ten. What is he playing at? Not having me on the show. So it's a great honor for you to have. Yeah, me on. it is. And do you know what? You what's hilarious is that uh, when um, wh- you've now got this humongous uh, thing to 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 now compete against, which is that you, your your students think you're going to be the best ever guest. So you have it. <laughs> You have to hold that expectation. It's just not going to be but easy. Inshallah. But no, now, I'm inshallah. sure you do. I'm sure you do great. Uh, we've got so much to dive into. So, um, those of you who are listening, Sam is uh, most known to me, uh, and probably for many people, if you've been on social media for a while, as Arabic with Sam, which has now changed. And also, I do recognise you also as your username, Sam of Somalia. But now you're you're you're, you're on. You're just Sam Burr or Burr Burr. How do you pronounce it? <laughs> Just birds. It, I know it's a funny one, isn't it? It doesn't really Burr. sound like a name. It's just more of a more of a sound. Burr. But um, yeah, I like to um, I like to think maybe there's maybe it has its origins in Allah's name Al Bar. But you need to do one of those like um, one of those tests. There's a uh, uh, what, what are they called like. So, the, the ancestry yeah robot. there's ancestry yeah. tests yeah, yeah yeah i've had lots of accusations that maybe i'm not like fully white and stuff that i might have my um my, my origin somewhere further back because it's i look suspiciously different to my brother and my sister really but, um, are they blonde? yeah yeah um they're very light like very fair my brother's beard's ginger and like my, my brother and my sister both have like fair brown hair but my dad looked exactly like me when he was when he was younger like he okay. had jet black hair jet black beard and stuff so nice yeah um, yeah yeah it's, it, it, well it's, it's lovely to have that kind of difference in the family so uh, uh, uh i think it's an in- inviting difference i'd, I'd say uh th- those Sorry. of you who don't know sam Sam is an Arabic teacher in his essence, aren't you? And um, m- but more than that, you, he it turns out that you're um, a man of many languages, and I'm I'm looking forward to diving into that in the episode. So uh, l- why don't we get into it? Uh, because I'm I'm so so excited to unpack it all. Let's start at the very beginning of your journey to Islam. So which is which is the true beginning? Let's be honest. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so let's get started with that. So, I, I the lovely thing about this episode is that I also don't know almost anything about your story other than the kind of the brief conversation we had last week, uh, and that's more so to do with kind of where you're at in life now. So, I, I am really intrigued to, to to learn about this myself. So, um, I suppose we will start with like what was life growing up for Sam Burr, and uh, then how did you how did you come to know about Islam? So I grew up in the UK. Um, I've always been in the countryside. I've never been in a city. Um, I was actually born in Northampton, but I grew up in Cornwall. Um, yeah, m- most people who are listening to this from the UK will know about Cornwall. But for, for those of those of you who are abroad, Cornwall is it's just a very beautiful and very rural part of the UK where I grew up. And and that was where I found Islam. And, and the way that really came about was um, when I was at college, I studied world religions. And to be honest, that even came about by serendipity really like uh, I didn't even want to do religious studies like here in the UK like RE and studying religions isn't really seen like as a serious subject but it came about because I wanted to do German um, at A level but I hadn't done it at GCSE so the German teacher obviously just knew I was just terrible at languages generally so she kicked me out and the only thing I could do was study of religions, but obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had obviously chosen that for me and, um, and obviously a, a, a good result came from that for me. But um, yeah, so that, that was kind of how I came across learning about, about Islam at the time, the college as kind of their, um, one of their main religions that we were studying as part of that course was Islam. Like it's actually changed now. 
I wonder why that is. I wonder if there were a number of students who embraced Islam after <laughs> after, after learning about it. But um, yeah, and I remember one of the assignments that that my lecturer gave us was she sent us one of those links to like Quran Explorer. And our assignment was to listen to some recitations of the Quran and talk about how it would make a believing Muslim feel. And firstly, like I, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that assignment. Like these days, I don't I don't feel like with all of the politics around around Islam and around teaching Islam in our institutions and stuff here in the UK. I don't know if that kind of assignment would be tolerated anymore. But but anyway, I remember putting on my headphones, much like these, sitting in my bedroom in Cornwall and going to Quran Explorer and scrolling through it and not really recognize any of the titles. I didn't know what al-Baqara was or why one was called the bumblebee or why one was called an elephant. But um, and obviously, like our books in our Western culture, they start from the beginning, like you start in the beginning, even even the Bible is like this, like it starts from Genesis in the beginning and ends of the book of Revelations, which is about all the stuff near the Day of Judgment. So I just went to the beginning of the Quran and started listening to it. And obviously that had me roped into about two and a half hours of recitation of Surah Al-Baqarah. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, but as in, did you, 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 the first time you listened to Quran, you just listen to the whole of Surah Baqarah. Yep. Wow. I remember what so, made you do so, that? So what happened was this. I put my headphones on, just like these, press play. And obviously I couldn't understand a word of of Arabic. Like I, I don't come from a background of like being raised with any other languages at home. And I'd certainly never heard sounds like Ain and Saad and Qaf and Dad and Ra before in my life. But I knew listening to the Quran from the first Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, I knew it changed my life. Like it, it filled a void that I always thought music was supposed to in my life. It, yeah, just, just listening to it and the melody of the Quran, I, my, my heart found rest in it, and it, it never had done before. And I, um, I don't know. That's I, I don't know how you rationalize that. I don't know how I how I rationalize that and say these things added up and. And, um, and and now I'm a Muslim, but but before I even knew you could become a Muslim, like at the time I didn't know you could become a Muslim, or or it was something for all humanity, or any of those things. I just knew that this book is is serious business, and and I'm I'm going to dedicate a lot of my life to to learning the Arabic language and um, yeah to understand this. And that's kind of where my first interaction with Islam came from. Because bear in mind, I've never met Muslims in my life at this point in my journey. At this point, like I yeah well, yeah. Something? I was yeah I was gonna say that it's, it, that that w the, um, statement would have shocked me uh, when uh, ten years ago, but you know the fact that you're from Cornwall, uh, I I resonate that with uh, with that a lot because when I was studying in Cardiff, I Cardiff is a very uh, multicultural city as you probably know, and um, and so yeah there's Muslims there's there's all religions in Cardiff, but Cardiff is a city which is obviously the capital of Wales. And is very multicultural. Anything outside of Cardiff, the further you go, and it doesn't take long to go far out of Cardiff, you start getting to areas where Islam is completely strange. And so I had a really, really good friend at university, right? His name was Titch. Obviously, it wasn't his real name. He was he, he was small and and hench, right? And so it was kind of like a it was kind of like a it was it was kind of like true and not true at the same time because he was quite small, but then also he's massive. Uh, so anyway, Titch, uh, we, we, you know, we would go to lectures every day together and we'd um, revise together, learn each other's, uh, uh, learn from each other's notes. We became really good friends. So I trained together in the gym and it was only in my third year in university when, I don't know, he must just become comfortable to have this conversation with me. We were walking back to the kind of, uh, where the student houses were and he said, I've never met a Muslim, and bear in mind, sorry, Titch at this time was 28 or something. He was a bit, I think he, he was kind of like a mature student. I would have been like 22. Maybe he was like 26. Um, he goes, I've never met a Muslim. And he goes, I've never even, I don't even know what Islam is. And I, I was shocked. I was like, Titch, you're like 26, 27 years old. You've never, and he goes, no. And um, that's when he opened up and started asking all of these questions. And he, it was like, it, it was also new to him, and that's when I realised that there's there are still so many people who who haven't heard of Islam or don't know much about uh, Islam or at the very least have never even met a Muslim. And he said, "All I know about Islam is what I've seen on the TV." And uh, I think we take for granted, uh, we being like people from from big cities like London, we take for granted uh, having that kind of diverse 
culture and and the ability to to meet all different types of people from the age of five when we're in reception all the way until you know university in, in when you're 18 years old so yeah that's that doesn't surprise me actually that you that you hadn't met a muslim although it would have done a few years ago subhanallah it also kind of um when i ponder upon that a little bit also it also kind of calls into question how our da'wah should take place because we we often give da'wah with the expectation that people think they know a lot about Islam and then we try to like dispel their misunderstandings that we assume they have right like we we start speaking to controversial topics right when we're kind of doing our da'wah but like if somebody like what, what happened in my life was that Allah chose for me to hear Islam and I was ready to accept it like uh, there wasn't like a big there wasn't like a big barrier that I had up or like this is the Quran and it's the thing that like brown people listen to in the Middle East and they're dangerous so but like perhaps if a person had come to me to give da'wah they would have had assumptions that I had uh, they would have assumed that I thought certain things about them whereas like you know the friend that you're talking about he was just he just had questions for you do you know what I mean it was just a person who hadn't heard it and so he just asked you stuff about it you know and it, it's um it's an interesting um point to perhaps make with our dower but i mean in, in my, in my st- yeah no no that, that is an incredible point so 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 you you just track back on the, the the moment when you're listening to quran in your room so i do find it odd that you would start listening to quran and and two and a half hours later you're still listening to it i suppose i've never been introduced to quran like that because i've always known of quran whether it was active in my life from a child or not i was born muslim alhamdulillah and so i knew of the quran i can't imagine that i, I hope that i would have but i can't imagine that i would have started listening to it and then been two and a half hours deep on the first time it, which is incredible in itself uh but you say that you were kind of ready to accept islam from that moment i i, I want to know more about that because uh, is that exactly how it took place? Did you listen and you were convinced and you were ready or did it take more research? And then how long from that moment till you actually took shahada? So, yeah, at this point, obviously, I, I don't understand the, the Qur'an. And like I, as well, I don't really know very much about Islam. I, I just know that this Qur'an is something beautiful. That was all I really knew. But but more than it just being beautiful, like I'd I'd listened to things in the past that I thought were beautiful. It, it wasn't that. It was that it, it offered a calm in my life. And, and also, I, as I was trying to kind of move my tongue and follow along with it and stuff, the same way that perhaps at the time I might have listened to some music and I might have tried to, like, learn the words. Like, I was I was kind of doing that similarly with the Qur'an. I was listening to it and I had such admiration for, like, the just how just how beautiful and its melody it was that I wanted to kind of, I wanted to start, I wanted to start reciting it myself. But this is all kind of going along um, when I'm also studying Islam as part of my stuff at college. So I'm learning about what Tawheed is and I'm, I'm learning about what the Salah is and I'm coming across, you know, some bridges like that Muslims actually believe in in Jesus السلام, and believe in some of the prophets I'd heard of before. I'm, I'm not from a specially religious background. Um, you know, my family are quite traditional, like being from the countryside, you'll find even us white people from the countryside are, are more traditional. Like in my family, people get married in my in, in my family and we we uphold traditions and stuff and we you know even a lot of people might be surprised even about like my little sister for example like my little sister doesn't just like just go out at night and stuff like my mom always would have had me or my brother walk my sister through town if she needed to walk through town at night and stuff like that like we're i don't know we're, we're, we're just more culturally conservative i guess us people who grew up in the countryside and so anyway like i, I was kind of resonating with with parts of islam but I, that the impact that listening to the quran had on me i'm I was probably about 16 years old at this point it it just gave me a conviction in it and i had i hadn't really experienced conviction in in something before that but it was it was that this quran is beautiful and i couldn't the the most obvious thing to me was that it was from allah right that was the most obvious thing like it didn't seem obvious to me that like a person had written this and made it up or like or it was like that like a band or whatever like i'm I'm only saying that us muslims we wouldn't use that language but at the time i'm thinking about 16 year old sam thinking who produced this thing right you know so i i had real certainty in it and you know i i knew as i kind of started to learn more about islam i i thought well to have this quran in my life more that's that's going to require being a muslim it's, you know, it's there's, it's so interesting to kind of come to Islam because it it weighs very heavily on you, like Islam and when Allah calls calls to us in the Quran is there, there's no like trying to sell the Quran to us. It it weighs very heavily on us. Is this is the truth? This is this is kitab la raiba fihi. This is the book in which there's no doubt. There's there's these statements of conviction that that really resonated with me, 
um, early in my journey. So, so as I was kind of just learning more things about Islam, it was just adding more things to the things I was ready to accept. There wasn't a, there were things that, that interfered with my desires. Like at that age, I would have loved to have like, you know, been drinking and having girlfriends and stuff at that age or whatever. Like there were things that, 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 that interfered with my desires, but I remember saying to my friends and stuff, I was, I was saying to them, well, if you believe, you believe, don't you? Like I, I just had a conviction in that, well, belief and believing something's true, that that's more important than, than what you feel. And I hadn't really ever had that concept introduced to me before, before Islam. I mean, but, but to answer your question about how long it took me to take my Shahada, it was maybe, so I started learning about Islam in January of maybe 2010, I think. And I embraced Islam in the November that year. So, so it's almost a whole year, you know, it, it's almost still a whole very year, quick. Yeah, perhaps from going from a position where I don't know any Muslims in my life, and I've never even heard of Islam, really, other than like bits on the news, up to being a Muslim at the masjid and stuff. But there's there's whole there's so many other barriers to kind of come across for, for me at the time in Cornwall, like, I didn't know where a masjid was. And like, you know, Islam, it really just screamed sincerity to me. But when, when I was learning about it, like all Allah really wants from you is sincerity. It doesn't require you to pledge allegiance to a particular building or a, or a particular person. It, it really was the case that this is your direct relationship with Allah, with, with your creator. And so through that, I thought, well, if I kind of just take my own shahada in my bedroom, then that's also kind of still counts, which there's something to be said for that, right? Like if you don't have access to a masjid or like there's something to be said for, for coming with that sincerity. But before you, before I knew that, um, it's good to take it in the presence of, of the community and stuff and all the benefits that come with that. But, you know, it was like, so I, so I was trying to learn Arabic by myself up until like that September. And then when I'm back to college in that September, I started an Arabic class at the university, uh, sorry, at the college um, here in Cornwall. This was all to try and understand the Quran. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the Arabic teacher at my college, she told me that there was a masjid. Because as well, I'd, I'd been on Google Maps. I knew how to use Google Maps. I knew that there was an Islamic center in Cornwall. But I'd heard all this like madness on the news about there being different types of Muslims and there being some some masjid that other, some Muslims don't go to and stuff. And I, I don't know, I was re reluctant to go until this woman, um, who, who was the Arabic teacher, a Lebanese woman, and may Allah bless her, she um, she actually, but so I hadn't actually taken my shahada in a masjid at this point. Um, but I knew quite a lot of the Quran just from listening to the Quran. I knew about ten pages of Surah Al-Baqarah, um, but I'd, I'd never <laughs> ten bit of, by heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, 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 learned, I'd, mem I'd memorized my first hizb at that point before I'd even like taken my shahad there in, in the masjid. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, so I think she. I don't know. She even if I didn't, even if I didn't know, even if I didn't have any of that knowledge, like she still would have directed me towards the masjid. But she also found me a, a Quran teacher as well. Um, yeah, a Quran teacher called Abdul Salam, an Algerian teacher. And so I just started going to that masjid every weekend. And I kind of joined in with the class with the kids and started learning Allahu Ahad and, you know, things like that with the kids there. And um, yeah, and then it was maybe I'd, I'd, I'd been going there for about two weeks when they'd realized they were like, have you, have you even taken your shahada here? And I was like, no, I haven't. Do I need to? <laughs> and yeah, so I remember taking my shahada in the masjid in Cornwall, and yeah, as I say, in the in the cold mornings of a November here in Cornwall. Wow. So Hannah, yeah. you you uh, uh, revert stories are always so inspiring, and they always um, seem to have very similar themes. But you always get different elements that um, that make you realize. I suppose the, the the beauty of Islam, because when you hear people's revert stories, for some, it's like, you know, I was going through a lot of hardship and there was like this aha moment. And for others, it was, it's like, you know, uh, I was uh, receiving da'wah, somebody was giving me da'wah. I know uh, people who have said, uh, you know, growing up, I've always had Muslim friends. And at one point I just started asking them about Islam. And so, and you hear a lot about the Quran as well. And so it's always interesting hearing different ways in which like Allah chooses to guide his servants. And it makes you, it strengthens your iman really, doesn't it? Listening to these kind of stories. And I'm sure it must strengthen your iman even telling them because you're like kind of in a sense like reliving it, right? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I mean, it was it was at this point, so after I took my shahada and I was, I was at college at this point still, kind of in my second year now. And it was that point when my, my love for languages really kind of took hold. Like something I found so, so so compelling about Islam is 
how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sort of dignifies us humans through revealing a linguistic miracle in the Quran. Like it's not a coincidence that Allah describes, that refers to the Quran as lisan and arabiyan, that it's an Arabic tongue. Because us humans, like we're, we're perhaps maybe some of the only of the, of, of the creatures that communicate using our tongues. If you think mm -hmm. about how most animals communicate, it's from their throats. But most animals, they don't use their tongues. And Allah has sort of dignified the human in that way. And even, even the fact that it's a book itself, I understood even then how fitting it is that Allah would reveal a book, how dignifying to kind of human intelligence it is, re revealing a book, and, and how that's a miracle that can be carried through the ages as well. Like it's it's not like the miracles of Isa alayhi salam or Musa alayhi salam but that were only for the people present. It's um It's a book that I can... I can sit in my bedroom in the Cornish countryside and I can open its pages and I can actually, actually hear the speech of Allah. I can actually read the speech of Allah. Like that's, that's something, that's a gift that I, I had, I had, I had an understanding of and of something I found so compelling about Islam. And, and I, I, I knew I kind of, it weighed heavy on me that, that I was a Muslim at this point, but I didn't really understand Arabic. It weighed really heavy on me. I thought, I thought, how am I going to justify to people that are questioning me and my Islam that I know what I'm talking about as a Muslim and I actually have read and understood this book if I don't know Arabic? That 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 weighed heavy on me. So I I decided that I decided to do my degree in the Arabic language. But before that, I was I was set. I was applying to do my degree in Spanish and English literature. I think at the time, and um, I just changed my mind. Um, I said no. I want to. I want to apply to do my degree in Arabic and. And yeah, alhamdulillah, I was accepted at university in London, and, and that, that's how I ended up in London um, to do my Arabic language degree. Yeah, so that was that was like 2011, I think, when I when I moved to do my Arabic language degree. So just tracking back to uh, shahada. So you've taken your shahada. Uh, I suppose like you took your shahada over the length of like a couple um, months. It sounds like you kind of took it by yourself, and then you and then you you know, um, announced your shahada in the masjid, should I say, how was it taking it initially and, and then taking it again in the masjid? Like, what, what did you feel once you had taken your shahada? Because like, you kind of came in with some education of Islam prior to shahada. Some people take shahada and say, okay, now today is day one. It kind of sounds like you had some prior knowledge now because you'd been doing research for a few months. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a funny thing. Like when, when people sort of talk about embracing Islam, we... We get this kind of um, an impression that it's about a moment or it's like kind of one moment where it all kind of makes sense. Like I, I didn't really have that. I just kind of I learned things about Islam and then I started kind of testing them with my friends saying, like, I've learned this thing about Islam. And I'd find myself sort of defending it against them and stuff. And I, I just kind of one day found myself being convinced of Islam in its entirety. Um, it was it wasn't really the case. Like so, some people learn Tawheed and they get it. They accept Tawheed. You know, so some people, right? But for for me, there was there was more of a journey in that. And also, remember, like a lot of people who have Muslims around them, they're being encouraged to take their shahada and stuff. But I had no Muslims encouraging me to take my shahada. Like I, I didn't have that at all. It was it was only coming across like YouTube channels and stuff where people take their shahada and you know how to take the shahada, how to become a Muslim, and things like that. You know, so so that that's the reason I suppose it was it was that nobody was really telling me to take my shahada and stuff. But the the, the feeling, you know, it's, it's difficult to describe a feeling when I took the shahada because it was something so kind of gradual. Like I remember when I, when I, that day when I came back from the masjid and I told my dad that I'd taken my shahada, he was like, I thought you'd been a Muslim for months. Like I'd already been telling it's him about Islam for ages. Yeah. Like that's a very you know, common thing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, you know, and my, you know, my, my family, like, you know, may Allah guide them. I, I absolutely love them to pieces. Alhamdulillah. I have a really, really close relationship with all my family and everything. And there, um, you know, obviously, cause that's another thing. That's another whole kind of dimension to, to the journey, I guess that like we're from a small, like fishing village in Cornwall. Yeah. Like everyone knows each other. Right. And I, I had a job growing up in the bakery there. Um, I used to, yeah, but I used to go down there at like four in the morning. Sometimes I'd pray Fajr at work. I'd be down there at like four in the morning and I'd, you know, would put, put the pasties in the oven and all that stuff and bake bread and donuts and whatever. And um, like when, when I embraced Islam, it was talk of the town in lots of ways, because obviously, because we're working at that time in the morning, we're having breakfast there. And we used to have like full English breakfast with bacon and sausages and stuff. And it was like, like the other bakers and like my, my boss and stuff was like annoyed that I wasn't eating the bacon and sausage anymore <laughs> and things like that. And I, I know that my parents and, and my brother and my sister have have really had to defend me. Like I know they have, and I'm I'm immensely grateful to them for that. Like I, 
you know you don't you don't get to grow up in in a little village in cornwall and your son embraces slam without a few other guys at the pub putting it on you you know you don't get to be a mother of a you know a boy who embraces islam when he's like 16 17 and then and not have the other mums ask you if you're disappointed or when your son's going to grow out of this phase and all those things so you know i'm immensely grateful to them so what was that like so i was going to ask if you had told them straight away and, and you said that as soon as you took your child you came home and told them so have you guys always been as close as you are or do you did you feel very comfortable to to even when you were learning about islam were you kind of communicating that back to your parents so i really loved islam from the first time i heard the quran so as i was learning more about it i really wanted to bring my family on the journey with me like a yeah, so I, I was really telling them about it all the time. And and like, I was reciting the Quran in my bedroom regularly. Like I sat in my bedroom most days after after college coming home and, you know, trying to memorize bits of the Quran. There were certain parts of the Quran that I thought were just, um had such a beautiful melody. Like I remember I, I memorized Surah Al-Qiyamah before I memorized Surah Al-Ikhlas. Like Surah Al-Qiyamah, I just thought it was a really beautiful Surah. But I would be like in my room memorizing is, the Quran it? and stuff. Yeah, yeah, really beautiful Surah. That um, Surah actually resonates with me as well because I, as uh, people know from my story, I started kind of like falling in love with Islam when I was at my time in university. And there was a period of time where I was like, okay, I need to start like praying and stuff. And so I'd, I'd walk to the masjid for Fajr and Cardiff is it's wet and it's rainy, it's cold. And when you finally get into the mosque, it's like, oh, you feel the like the radiators are on, and it's the best feeling ever. Just walking like, oh, and then you you dread the walk back as well. And the walk back was uphill. And the Imam, the Fajr Imam, every now and again he would recite Qiyama Fajr, and mm-hmm. I just I fell in love with it at that point. I was like, I, I really want to memorize this surah. And I remember memorizing it quite early or trying to memorize it quite early because of that as well. So that resonates with me for some reason. It just, Allah. yeah, it reminds Allah. me of a warm, warm, warm winter, e- like war- cold winter mornings, but like very warm in the mosque. Yeah. So yeah, mashallah. it's interesting. You yes. That. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my family were kind of coming on the journey with me and stuff really at this point. I think it, it did. In the beginning, I mean, my, my brother and my sister were very different ages then to what they are now. So at this point, I'm like 17, so my big brother's like 20. And the dynamic between a 20-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy is very different to like now, like a, you know, like a 28 and a 31-year-old boy. Like we're we're real adults now. <laughs> but back then, like my, you know, the, the dynamic was completely different. My brother sort of came back from uni to find out that, that I was a Muslim or whatever. <laughs> and my, my little sister was at school and stuff like my little sister was at school and her friends asking her like is it true that your brother's in islam now <laughs> and, and my, my sister having to kind of learn how to kind of um to deal with that and her trying to improve her knowledge of islam as well so she could she could defend her big brother a little bit but we, it's it's definitely like in our family now it's just not even an issue at all and, and in terms of like values we're, we're really aligned like when we talk about the importance of perhaps things like marriage or um, things like that, like we're we're just we're very very aligned. We've kind of we've kind of grown into it, if you know what I mean. It doesn't surprise me because you said earlier that the Quran, it just or Islam in general, it really brings out sincerity. And what it, I thought of when you said that is that w- the Quran. I always feel so humbled by how it calls to the fitra as well. It's like if if somebody chose to be honest and sincere with themselves, I I I I I I just can't believe that they wouldn't agree with every single thing in the Quran. If the but the the problem is is being honest and sincere with yourself. It's having an opinion that you're scared that society might not agree with, or that your the, your loved ones might not agree with. And if you can put if you can put those things aside. And that's a really difficult thing to do. It's a lot harder to do than said. But if you can put those things out, it's like, okay, let me just uh, have like a, a, do an exercise, a mental exercise, right? Let me pretend like I can do blue sky thinking. I I can think and there's no one who's going to tell me off my thoughts. No one's going to be there to, to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you thought that. Let me just sat here by myself, pretend like I'm open to the opinions of the Quran. If somebody can do that exercise, I think that they would really find that it just aligns so perfectly with their soul and they're actually not uncomfortable with any of the rulings or the uh, descriptions or anything uh, that Islam comes with. I think the problem is getting to the point now where you can 
uh, take all of those, strip all of that kind of outside, all of those layers away and have that really honest conversation with yourself. And, and, and I think the other thing is, sorry to harp on, but I think the other thing is, is that um, it also requires you to go through a process of accepting that you might be wrong in certain areas and you might be really wrong and you might be committing a sin and that's too difficult to unwind and i think that you you sometimes have that issue when you speak to muslims who try and defend certain types of riba for example and it's like and that's just an example but like you, are you I've, i think all of us have had conversations with muslims where it's like, like that's riba right and it's like the conversation almost comes across like that person may agree with you but they're so deep into it it's so difficult to unravel and unwind that it's a lot easier to say it might not be riba and uh, i think like if you now that's just a microcosm of like imagine an entire life like you've lived 30 years 40 years 20 years 15 years whatever it is and you've had all these beliefs and you've and you feel comfortable having the same opinion as society because it's a safe thing to do and you're then always liked and who doesn't want to be liked and all of those kind of things. But if you can, like I said, do that exercise. If anybody's listening to this and hasn't, you know, accepted Islam and I, I would I would really recommend that. I would say do an exercise where you just think to yourself, what if it was true? And see if um see if you feel comfortable with those answers. That's a very interesting thing to to ponder over a little bit about the idea of accepting that you're wrong. Because when you said that, I was thinking about what a blessing it is that I found Islam early. Because it's much it's much more, accepting that you're wrong about something is much easier to do when you haven't even formed lots of opinions yourself anyway. You know, you're kind of an, an, an empty vessel in a sense, ready to accept something that's true. Because when you're you know, or when I was, you know, 16 or whatever, I don't know, like you might ramble on about some opinions that you have about something, but you're not kind of set in your ways like, like you are when you're older. And I mean, I'm, I'm a really big believer in that. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that, that Allah, Allah gave me the opportunity to get married relatively young as well. And I, I, I really believe in that. And I, you know, what, what, how old were you when you got married? At 22. Oh, same age. Do you know what? It's so crazy how similar our journeys are, not they? Like we're both 28 years old, both got married at 22. I think both of us might have, do we both have two children? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. We're finding more and more similarities. Yours are two boys as well, right? Yeah, yours are two boys? Two boys. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Subhanallah. Mashallah. Subhanallah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Both so we, 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 one could argue that both of our children speak sign language, but we can yeah, we delve into that a bit later. I mean, on a very, I think there's a big difference in the two, but we'll delve into that in a bit. Uh, okay, okay let's, yeah, let, let's carry on the story. Otherwise, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to make that progress because I, I think sure. I could talk to you about each individual element for, for hours and hours, and I think it will warrant another sure. a second episode. Uh, okay, so where we're at at the moment is you've taken Shahada, your family have really cool accepted it, and you're now in university, you're studying Arabic. Yeah. So, where do you want to take yeah, so this? That, so, so um, I'll take it in the, in, the, um, in the direction of the benefit of moving to a place with more Muslims. Okay. Perhaps the thing that was the most beneficial about moving to London wasn't just the fact that I was moving to um, dedicate myself full time to learn the Arabic language, but also being in an environment where, where I can have a positive influence of other Muslims. Because believe me, like I, you know, I I wonder if, if I had chosen like a different university or something like that. Like when we look at some of the cultures that there are on some university campuses and stuff, I don't know if I'd have been strong enough to to, to handle the the fitna that there is in some other environments. But but Alhamdulillah, the university I went to, it has a really good. Um, really good ISOC has a good Muslim community and it's also not like a party university like the university that I went to p people can do degrees in quite specific things like lots of very specific African languages you can do a degree in Ibo and Hausa and you can do a degree in Swahili and stuff and people don't tend to choose to do a degree in Swahili when they're 18 you know what I mean like maybe they've traveled and they've they've fallen in love with a particular country or something and and then so, so we have a lot of more mature students so I was that there was a real benefit for me that I, I went to a university without that kind of party culture. Like uh, Allah had a specific plan for me and, 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 we, and we, we, we cannot escape Allah's qadr. You know, I'm not saying that things would have been different. I'm, I'm saying that I'm, I'm grateful that Allah put me in an environment with, with Muslims that are a positive impact on me. So, um, yeah. And then, so I'm, I'm studying Arabic full time at this point. That's, that's what a lot of people need. I think maybe something I wanted to say when I, I said that I kind of chose to do my degree in the Arabic language is lots of people need to commit to something to learn Arabic. Like I kind of knew about myself. If I don't commit to something, 
I'm going to spend my life dabbling in a book of Arabic here, telling myself I'm going to study Arabic there, telling myself next year, maybe I'll enroll in a course Like I would have spent my life like that maybe. And I, I just, I didn't want to risk that. I said, look, like we've got an opportunity to go to university, do a degree full time and dedicate myself to something full time because the, the Arabic language to get to a, a very significant level in it, it requires some sacrifice and some structure in your life and, and some hard work and not, I, I didn't know. I'm not, I'm not saying I didn't, but I'm, I'm saying I don't know if, if at that stage in my life, I trusted myself with just to, just studying Arabic by myself. So I, I, I saw the merit in going to university to study Arabic. And yeah, so I'm studying Arabic full time. First year is really just beating Arabic into you. Like you don't do many other fun topics. You don't really get into literature or anything like that. They're just kind of beating Fusha into you for a whole year. Second year, um, did some Islamic texts um courses and stuff and the one that i really loved the most was um a module on biography and traditions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that was when i kind of started to write a few essays on the eloquence of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i think that's a topic that isn't covered enough in the english language like how eloquent and how beautifully spoken our beloved messenger was so that that was something i really loved and then third year i went to palestine for my year abroad when you went to Palestine, you told me this last week, I found that really interesting. So did you choose Palestine or did you have option of like a few different countries? Or could you stay in the UK? So no, you couldn't stay in the UK. It was a condition of the degree that you you did a year abroad. Um, but it, it was a really strange time in, in, in the Middle East that um, obviously the, the war in Syria started the year that I started my degree. So there were lots of people on, on my cohort who actually decided to do Arabic because they wanted to go to Damascus. Like there were lots of people who, who who started the degree because of that, and then that wasn't available to them. But by the time it came around to us, it was a situation that the safest place to go and learn Arabic was Palestine. Like, think of that. You wouldn't think that that would be the, the situation in, in the Middle East, would you? But but that, that was the situation. It was the safest. Like Nablus, the city where I studied, was Amazing. probably the safest. So so a load of the students came, came with us to Nablus, and there was... Um, most of the students went to Amman in Jordan, but uh, I think our experience in Palestine was for, purely for learning language was was truly unique because there aren't like tourists in Nablus the same way that there are in, in, in other cities. And like, Nablus is a, you know, I would I would highly, highly recommend that people go go to Palestine generally. But but Nablus is a really beautiful city. And even in my my journey as a Muslim at that point, it had a, a hugely beneficial impact on me. Like being in an environment where I could hear the Adhan five times a day and I could walk to the masjid and, and actually see a, a Muslim majority community. And it was good as well because Nablus is quite a conservative, like practicing Muslim environment as well. There's some places, like some people could embrace Islam and then take themselves off to some cities and it just be a shambles in, in terms of like their idealistic and perceptions of Islam. But for me, Nablus was, was everything I wanted. It was it was, um, you know, a place where the practicing of Islam was easy and, and the things that were haram were clearly haram. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying they didn't happen, but they, they stuck out like a sore thumb because there just weren't so many of them. So it was, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I made that choice and had a, had a massive benefit on me being able to go to a university where my teachers didn't speak Arabic. And I, I wrote my dissertation that year in Arabic and stuff. And it was, um, do you, it was do really you mean cool your, your teachers didn't speak English? Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, my, my lecturers at university they didn't speak English, so you know whether you like it or not, you you will be speaking Arabic. Hey guys, just want to pause the discussion with Sam for a second to say a quick thank you to our partner for this episode, Bright Sun Travel. Here's some great news for those of you wanting to travel to FIFA World Cup 2022 or have already got tickets for the FIFA World Cup 2022 but are struggling to get accommodation due to a lot of it being sold out. Bright Sun Travel have teamed up with the Saudi Tourism Authority to help you stay in Saudi during the World Cup. Now you might be thinking, how am I going to stay in Saudi when the World Cup is in Doha? Well, did you know that the commute from Saudi to Doha is just over an hour. Like a regular commute, basically. Head over to btpilgrimages.com forward slash football. That's btpilgrimages.com slash football. Or click the link in the description. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah, it sounds like that's what what you need, right? I, I, I wonder how you being in Palestine affected your relationship with Palestine. You, where I've uh, anywhere I've ever stayed, and I've only stayed in two or three places outside of London. I find that I then seem to have like a nice, uh, a deep connection with that place, and my ears kind of pop up when somebody says that they're from that place. And uh, it, it sounds silly because obviously it's not even like 
a comparable to Palestine, but I the a few weeks ago I was in the gym out here in Dubai, and the guy next to me, he's doing some deadlifts or something. He's on the phone. He's on his AirPods at the same time, and I I could just because he was speaking quite loud. I could hear I could hear him. I wasn't trying to listen to his conversation, but he sounded like he had a Welsh accent. And so after he was done, I said, "Are you are you from Wales, bro? Did I hear a Welsh accent?" And he goes, "Yeah, I'm from Cardiff." I said, "No way." I said in Cardiff, and when we had this like lovely chat about. Cardiff, right? And uh, it does do that. And so I can only imagine that Palestine is in different levels. So, like, do you feel like a deeper connection with Palestine? Having so lived there? De yeah, definitely. Definitely. The But the specific reasons for it and specific things I can refer to aren't as just aren't as, aren't as specific as um, perhaps what you mean. Just a, a generally... I just generally have a deeper love, I think, for the, the the people and the place, I suppose, and the literature as well. Like it's something I've tried to promote on my YouTube channel and stuff as well, particularly Palestinian Arabic literature. Um, it's something that I like to, it's something that I really enjoy teaching to my students, um, Palestinian literature, because li literature generally is so humanizing. Like when you see such a deep narrative from from an individual person's perspective, it's, um yeah, so so definitely that. But, but for me, it was... It was more of a just a Muslim experience than a particularly Palestinian one. That was that was more how I saw it. It was it was just me as a as a person who was chosen Islam, living in the Muslim lands. I saw it in a very kind of Islamic idealist way, like that. Okay, so uh, let's carry on with the story then. So uh, you studied your year, you've graduated. I'm assuming now in Arabic. Is so I had then... so Arabic's four years. So oh, when I oh, came really? back, oh because of yeah, the Arabic... because the third year was abroad. Right, yeah. So, so in my final year, obviously, I'd done my dissertation in Arabic at, at Najah University in Palestine. So when I came back, I didn't have to do a dissertation. So they were like, do you want to do something else? And my supervisor actually said to me, why don't you learn Somali? My, my supervisor said this that This happened me. at university, did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is in my fine. final year. You're, you're supposed to take four modules. And I had one empty. And my supervisor was like, look, what opportunity are you ever going to get? to be lectured by like authors of books in these like very specific African languages. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. um, and I thought, good point. Let's give Somali a whirl. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it was, it was, it was maybe a little bit more than that. Like I'd, I'd th that summer before I went to, went back to do my fourth year, I'd gone to do some Dawa in Uganda and I'd been in okay. Uganda for, for a couple of months before that. And I'd met many, many Somalis. Like I'd learned bits of their language from them as well. And, you know, e eaten with them and eaten their food and that stuff. And the, the Somalis are, they seem to be pretty active in their Dawa in Uganda. And there's, there's tons of Somalis in Uganda. And um, so I already had like a, a certain level of love for their language. And I was intrigued, intrigued by their language as well, because that, Although it's although it's not similar to Arabic, Somali is not a similar language to Arabic. It has bits of pronunciation which, if you've learned Arabic already, it will help. You know, and even bits of vocabulary as well. Actually, there's that. It's usually the case that there is an originally Somali word, but they've adopted a a more recent Arabic word. Like a, you know, like an example is the word albab. Somali say albabka to mean the door, right? But there's but the word irid is actually the Somali original original word for it. But but anyway, so if you've learned bits of Arabic before, it will help you in in learning somali so so I, I took somali that year so before i'd ever met my wife before i knew she, allah had even created her like i was, i'd um i'd studied somali that year so i, I did a year of somali um yeah did that, you become that fluent year. in that year no 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 okay. like even now i don't, I don't sort of i i, I steer Come away from ter terms like fluent and stuff but i i i, I know somali well i would say i, I know yeah. it well you know, is, is, is what I is what I perhaps say, but so yeah, so that I did like it's like four hours a week of study, but to, to learn a new language that like Somali, it's it really takes a lot of practice with people oh, regularly, I can imagine. because the I mean the, the difficulty with Somali is kind of the opposite of Arabic. Like Arabic is made easier because there's so many resources for it, but Somali has the complete opposite. It, it doesn't have lots of resources, but it has lots of people. Whereas Arabic kind of has the opposite, particularly modern standard Arabic. Standard Arabic has very few people to like chat to because most Arabs don't use standard Arabic in their daily life, but it has incredible resources. Like the amount of resources that are available for Arabic uh, is just immense, but Somali is kind of the opposite. So you really need to go out into the world and use your Somali on actual humans. And yeah, so I mean, it was, it was, it was later in that year when I was at university, when I came across the woman who's now my wife, she was studying sign language um at the time she's in London studying and, um, yeah she was studying sign language yeah um it, but because even people who are fluent in British sign language like my, my wife's best language is British sign language um 
yeah, even people who are fluent in it, sign language goes up to quite high levels. Like level six, what they say is usually what you need to be like an interpreter and stuff. Okay. But not all not all deaf people are that are at that level, if you know what I mean. So, so she, so she was just, studying to be. Gone. Just to pause on that uh, and to give some context, you, you told me last week when we met that your wife is deaf, and you but you, what you had said is that she. Um, hadn't always, or, or, or that, it, that it, it, it tends to be a gradual process. Can you tell me a bit more about that, how, how, how that works? Yeah, so um, so my, my wife, her actual category would be hard of hearing. Um, okay. But when you're hard of hearing, you're you're still kind of part of the deaf community with a capital D. Um, so, so her actual category is hard of hearing. She st- still can hear a bit. But she wasn't deaf, as you say. She was she was raised in in Saudi Arabia, and she learned Arabic as a child. Um, even though she's from a Somali family, so she she knew Somali and knew Arabic, and but started she got a hear an ear infection when she was about eight years old. And um, in countries that don't have the NHS, obviously, it's not always you know you know it was a very it was a serious situation, and she ended up losing her ear, her hearing completely in one of her ears, and the other ear is just just declined ever since. And hearing, as I mentioned to you, doesn't it doesn't really get better, you know, sure. it, it, it does just kind of decline. So, sure. yeah. So, so this was when she was about eight, like, I think she was, okay. you know, I think her, her hearing was at a point where she couldn't go to like a normal school and stuff when she was maybe 10 or whatever. Okay. And then she came to the UK when she was about 16 and, and, and had to learn English without, you know, with, without being able to hear well. And honestly, she's, she's a woman male. I bless her. Like I'm, I've got such an admiration for her being a linguist myself I mean... and, and knowing how hard it is to, to learn a language even when you're hearing to to kind of um be around her having such command over a number of languages and still being hard of hearing because she's also kind of multilingual if that's the correct term in sign language like i mentioned to you that she's yeah. she, she's she's also fluent in somali sign language and she's kind of she's working on some things at the moment that are really instrumental in like codified it codifying a somali language and creating resources for it a somali sign language rather and creating resources for it and you know, so that's yeah. That 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 was the situation when I met her. I knew that a lot of our relationship would have to be in sign language. I, I knew that would be the case. And you know, I think the thing that perhaps the thing that even still now it almost it makes me even emotional thinking about it. That I'm a person who embraced Islam through hearing the beauty of the Quran, and to be married to a woman and whose friends don't get that blessing. That's something that like. You know, I, I think it's, I don't know, it's, but but like but women like my wife who can teach sign language and can, and can even teach the Quran through sign language and stuff. It's it's really beautiful to witness, Akhi. I don't know if you've ever seen women or, or anybody teaching teaching the Quran with sign language. They do things like, like, like my wife will be teaching the Quran to some other deaf girls and she'll she'll have the girls put their hand on her neck so they can hear the vibrations of how, when she's reciting and things like that. There's like, wow. it's, it's really specific and watching it is so beautiful that some people can make the Quran that when I heard it in my ears changed my life, but they can still make that accessible to people who can't hear. Wow. It's, um, it's something I, it's something I, I really think about. SubhanAllah. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think what's beautiful about that, I'm going to skip ahead a bit and then we'll come back to this part of the story is that when I asked you, um, I said, yo, Sam, you speak all these languages, English, Arabic, and, um, and Somali. What's, um, uh, what language do you speak at home with the kids? And you said we actually communicate at home in in sign language, and I said, that's so beautiful. So, I I I would love to be kind of like a uh, a fly on the wall in that environment where you're speaking to your children and and you're having a fruitful conversation. And I, I think I <laughs> I think when I got off the phone to you, I speak to my wife, and I said I just got off the phone to a really inspiring brother. He speaks um, English, Arabic, Somali, but. Uh, at home they communicate via sign language and us being in a situation where we have two young boys as well she said wow that must be a quiet household (laughs) (laughs) because sometimes the kids like but also they must be able to like they must be able to uh communicate like so much more than so i i I mean we'll go into the uh, the journey with the kids as well in this episode because I'll, I'll i'll kind of run over it but as you know i mean probably not just my kids alone like with all kids uh they find i think one of the most frustrating things is not being able to communicate or how they feel and we found the breakthrough when zachariah started communicating in some sign language and then all of a sudden he's like communicating how he feels and all of these different things and it's helped a lot and um and uh, yeah she was kind of making a point of that like uh, and you were you i think you were making a point of that when we were having the conversation so 
let's dive into that shortly into kind of the raising of the kids and and and, and sign language and speaking and communication in general but um you, we've come to a very interesting point of the story because everybody's always interested in marriage stories, right? So you 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 meet your wife, your now wife, and uh, at this point, had you decided that you were going to study BSL, or was it because uh, you got married? H- how, how did sign language then come into the mix? Because at this point, oh, no. you got Arabic, uh, and yes, you're studying Somali. Yeah, so, so like my love for the Somali language came before my wife that sure. did, but 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 sign language was completely for her. Um, wow. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, she's she's a, she's a woman of her virtue. I wanted to marry her. Um, I knew I'd have to learn sign language. Like at the time, she communicates well in English. I, I don't I don't want to um, I don't want to do a, a, a disservice to her because she's, you know, she's she's able to communicate and stuff. But but her best language is sign language. Um, yeah, so so I knew I would have to learn sign language. I, I knew that would be the case, as I mentioned. Hearing, you know, that perhaps there'll be a point when our entire relationship will have to only be through sign language. Whereas at the moment, we can kind of supplement it with bits of English and bits of Somali and stuff. But um, yeah, so that that was entirely for her. But I, even before having children, Echi, sign language, there's lots of benefits that us as modern humans can take from it, I think. Because the benefit that it has in my marriage is that when you communicate in sign language, you obviously need to be looking at each other when you're communicating with each other. And most humans don't really do that very much anymore. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so like my wife and I, we have to look in each other's eyes all day. <laughs> you know, we have to talk <laughs> to each other. Actually, we actually have to look at each other and, and actually be yeah, physically beautiful. present, actually physically present with each other. Yeah, and it, 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 has an, it has an immense impact on my marriage, I think, because we're th- these days because of our, because of our devices and also just because of our spoken language, we can be having a communication with our spouse when you're in the kitchen and she's in the living room or you're in the garage and she's upstairs or whatever. And maybe you don't really look at each other and be physically present with each other and but that's forced on you in sign language like you you've got no choice in sign language it's it's really interesting to see how your your personality overlaps into sign language because in spoken language we have things available to us like volume for example we can raise our voice if we want to make a point or something but in sign language you just be bigger yeah that's kind of the is that how it is really yeah yeah you just be bigger you know, that's all you can do. Or there's other things that the deaf community are very familiar with, like flicking lights on and off to get people's attention. Or even because okay. generally deaf people are more sensitive with their other senses. You can stamp on the floor and like that's like stamping on the floor in a room that's got like a wood floor or something. That's like that's like that's like pushing someone who's who's deaf. Like you'll see all their faces all turn to you like this. when You tap on the floor because that's like. You know that that's it to them. But, I, but before you before you say anything, I'll, I'll make one really quick point, inshallah, which is really interesting. So obviously, with with deaf people and people are hard of hearing, like my wife, their language is looking at you and and making gestures with your face and with your hands. So they're very sensitive to your moods. Like whereas in English, we think when we're speaking a spoken language, we think it's a more indirect form of communication for us to roll our eyes. Or so like oh like or to like huff at something. We think that's less direct, but to a deaf person, that's more direct. That's the equivalent of me just me just going phase. Shut up. <laughs> it's like the it's like the equivalent of that, right? Because it's it's just so obvious to them. Like when mm. you you know when you're you know when you're not communicating properly, and that's that that's something I've I've really had to kind of learn about myself in my marriage. Like if if with someone who uses a spoken language, I might be. I don't know, passive aggressive or something sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe all of us are sometimes or whatever, or I might kind of communicate in a way which isn't as healthy. Like someone who's hard of hearing or deaf will just pick that up immediately. It's so obvious to them. Yeah, yeah. so I grew up with my cousin during childhood who's hard of hearing and he ended up going to a, a deaf boarding school in the UK. He lives in Saudi now. And we grew up with each other, but then around, like, as in, like, for for our childhood, we spent every weekend together and stuff like that because it's my mum's brother's child, so first cousin. And then I think when we were all kind of like eleven or twelve, or, or perhaps slightly earlier, they moved over to Saudi, and then he came back for school. Now he's back in Saudi, and it's interesting because you're right. When with his uh, hearing not being great he has an amazing sense of smell. And there's been times where he's like almost saved people's lives because he's gone. I remember there was a specific time that my auntie was telling us about where I think they were in Saudi and he was a young kid at the time. And he was like, mom, mom, like something's burning. 
and nobody else could smell it and it turned out that yeah like i think like she had like the oven had been left on or something and it could have been a really dangerous situation had he not uh smells it so she, and then i was intrigued by that and she said yeah like b because of his hearing like his other senses are really strong and i didn't know at the time if that was like bro science or if that was legit but it sounds like you're kind of confirming that for me yeah yeah that is definitely the case just just out of practice i'm not i'm not saying that it's sort of like a it's like a superpower to, to that kind of level like when, when we talk about it sometimes it can be easy to get the idea that like your cousin can smell things like like a mile away and yeah, stuff yeah, it's yeah, like I'm, yeah. I'm not saying it's like that but it it, def it definitely is the case because those senses are just far more practiced they just have to be so that's definitely the case and I, obviously with obviously we we spoke previously about the impact it can have with your children with them kind of having that head start on being able to express their opinions and their and their feelings and what they want it avoids a lot of frustration in children like my my, my two little boys they've been able to ask for milk and water and say they want their mum or their dad from when they were incredibly young i'm talking like eight months or something yeah, they've been able yeah, to yeah. they've been able to say like mummy or, or milk or water like they've been able to be able to do that from a young age and you know as we, we've noticed it it improved their language oh, so incredible in, in, in lots of ways even their spoken language because they've just got a, a bit of a head start on their peers in terms of expressing themselves yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it, even just the idea that you can move or make sounds to convey messages just just having a head start on not being able to do that is, is it's been really cool to, to to witness it in my children because when when i was kind of when my wife and i were talking about like getting married and having children and stuff in charlotte obviously being someone who didn't grow up with multiple languages at home i always kind of had the idea that maybe we should raise our children being like really multilingual let's give them that gift of speaking all these languages at home that we have that that my wife and i both share but then as kind of when i when i started my work as a primary school teacher maybe we'll come on to that in the in the linear narrative of it but um, when I was, when I would kind of develop a really deep relationship with my class of four year olds who are like what, eight, nine years old, I realized how beneficial it is. And perhaps parents should prioritize a deep and meaningful relationship and communication in one language over spreading them really thin yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and perhaps, perhaps not having a, a deep communication with their children, but in other languages, maybe I'm not saying you can't have, have that relationship, but through all the languages, I'm, I'm not saying that, but, but like when when my children was born, but particularly my, my eldest Yusuf, uh, it really felt like what we should do with our children is just just enable just just empower them with a, a really strong capacity to 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 communicate full stop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've I, I, I think I'm aligned with you on that because what I've realized is that children pick up and learn really quickly. Yeah, and so, that's so true. with that being the case it probably is actually a lot more effective for them to learn one language really well, fast, and then you start another language really well and fast, and then another one, another one. But but to do them all at the same time can be confusing. And so <laughs> I'm actually going that right now. So Zachariah, um, it, he's, um, I think, got this dilemma. So he started learning the, uh, he's, he's like falling in love with this YouTube channel called Learn with, uh, called, uh, Learn with Zachariah, right? I don't know if you've seen it. No, no. Fine. So um, it's like uh, teaching Arabic in Arabic, uh, animals, alphabet, stuff like that. And there's no music. So that's what's like really cool about it. Uh, or not, uh, no, there's no, there's not been any, I can't say that for the whole thing. I think there's no music, but any of the videos we've come across is zero music in the back, which is like zero instruments. And so, um, so he's learned the alphabet and stuff, and that's all he wants to watch. He just wants to watch Learn Zachariah. And the, the problem here now is that Zachariah's learned all of these animals in, in Arabic, and he had previously learned them all in English. And now this is bit, I thought, and now I think he's a bit confused because, like, so he calls a cow, he doesn't call it Baqara, he calls it Baqaqa. I don't think he can say the raw for some reason. Right? So, like, now, like, the, the, the tough thing is, is that we don't know if he remembers that they're English anymore and so uh, th today I took him to the pharmacy and near the pharmacy there's this there's you know those what are they call those horse um those things that go around like a merry-go-round I think it's called right there's right. those things that are like on the horses and then like oh so yeah, yeah 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 I know what you mean yes yeah, so he he shouted he goes he goes, Hisan. And I was like, huh? And he's like, Hisan. I was like, it took me so long to like, clock, like, okay, that's what he's talking about. And the other thing is that he's also now um, saying things to his mom, like, and it was his mom, and his mom's like, I don't know what you're saying. And so it's, it's caused a bit of confusion, right? But he wanted to learn it. 
Uh, anyway, what's, what's interesting about the language thing, and it makes sense to talk about it now, is it, it, when you mentioned sign language, is that, um, so I told you this on in our chat, but I think perhaps it will be of benefit uh, generally for people. So we have, I don't think I've met really publicly spoken too much about our journey with Zachary's communication, but essentially um, he uh, w- st- struggled to communicate for a while. And he's now, he's going to be three next month, inshallah. Uh, but he started, he, he started walking very quickly. I think like uh, way before one, like maybe like seven months or eight months. And um, so we we're like, oh yeah, cool. Like he's fast with things. And he didn't start speaking until really late. Like he's only really started speaking properly now. And he's about to be three next month. And um, so when he kind of got to one and a half, like, you know, one and 11 months, two, now he's gone over two, two and one, two months. He's not really speaking much at all, almost, um, other than like, he can say car and stuff like that. We we were quite worried. And so the journey we kind of went through was that um, he ended up getting like referred to, uh, I can't remember what they call it now, um, early, like learning difficulties, kind of stuff in the UK with through the NHS and stuff like that and they, they were they were they were wondering whether he perhaps could be autistic and stuff like that and I think that was kind of a challenging time for us because I think anything any anybody going through that um you think oh I don't want my child to have a difficult life and stuff like that and so I think that was quite like an emotional time for us because we're like okay like let's just try and give him the best we can and it was tough man they were like I'll, I'll like say it like very openly there were times where like I'll be like drive. I'd like be like there was there was there was a period, a very short period of time where it started becoming like a really clear um, reality that uh, Zachary is probably autistic, and um, we that was because of a because like we were reading on the signs, which is not a good idea, and we were like he's he's like hitting like almost every sign, right? And then, the, but the main thing was that we were obviously going to these. Uh, th- like every time we'd go in to get him seen and checked out, you know, they were progressing with it. They were like, yeah, hmm, maybe he is. Yeah, he's doing this. This is a bit odd. Okay, let's fast track him to this. Let's let's take him to here. And and um, and so we were like, okay, cool. Like, let's, you know, accept uh, it for what it is. And during that s- a short period of time, like there'd be times where like my wife is very upset about it. And so I would be kind of just be like trying to be like strong about it. And I would say to her, look, Allah is how... Um, his slave thinks of him and so we think positive and we accept whatever it is but we also tell ourselves no he's fine and he will learn fine because when you have that positive thinking it does have an effect Um, and uh, however there were times where after me being kind of that positive I'd be I'd find myself like driving by myself in a long drive and then I'm like I'm like crying as I'm driving because I was you start thinking about things you start thinking I don't want him to have a difficult life and stuff like that and at that point there were two things that really changed things for us one is that I I spoke to Sheikh Mohammed Tim Humble and I told him the situation I said look I know you deal with a lot of family matters have you ever come across something like this and that conversation really changed my life he basically said a few things one of them being look Zachary is still very young and so people could uh, people are very quick to diagnose things and it turns out that it's not the case and so again he kind of like championed this idea of positive thinking and the other thing he said was um and he said so nothing he said nothing you've explained to me is like like super shocking to the point where it's like yeah it's written off like he's gonna have a difficult life he's gonna struggle to learn things um he said i've dealt with children in my like uh, when I'm dealing with cases that they're not speaking until they're five and then like they turn six and they're fluent. So he said it is, th- that does happen. However, he said, I recommend the, there's no harm in doing the, the seven day Rukia course that I've kind of put together. I'll do, I'll do some Rukia on him. And um, he said, Allah's words will never not benefit somebody. So it's, it's, it's like, a, why would you not do it? And so I did that, th- I did that course. Uh, simultaneously, Zachariah started, uh, my wife came across this YouTube channel where this person would teach children how to talk, uh, but they would use sign language really, it was American, so they use American sign language, uh, really almost primarily as the form of communication. Although they would say every word, but it's really strong on sign language. And... Um, Alhamdulillah, uh, Allah just like like that, everything just switched, bro. And um, 
man, all of a sudden, it was like there was like breakthrough moments where we'd be feeding Zachariah and he'd go, more? And he'd be like, my wife would be like, did you just see what he did? I'm like, what? Like he's asking for more and he's asking for sandwich. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, um, like, he'd be like, Zachariah, it's, it's time to go to sleep. And he'd be like, and I think in American sign language, perhaps this is milk, right? And so, like, Zachariah's time to go to sleep, he'd be like, milk? And then, um, and then it just got more and more advanced. And, uh, and that was amazing. And then that just opened up. And now, alhamdulillah, he's talking, like fully talking, alhamdulillah. And, um, you know, everything's fine. Uh, for, for uh, um, and and he still communicates as he uh, as he uh, now he'll communicate both verbally and through his hands at the same time, and um, we're actually really really grateful because it actually allows us to understand on a on a slightly deeper level. But I'll tell you why we're even more grateful than that. We're even more grateful than that because Zachary has a younger brother, as you know, his name is Khalil. And Khalil is just one. And Zachary couldn't speak at, at communicate at all. I won't even say speak, communicate when he was over two. And Khalil at one years old, bro, communicates with us fully and mainly through sign language. And so, and it's just amazing. <laughs> like, even this morning, like, um, you know, I was like, you, you know, you make him laugh. And then Khalil is like, again, again. Or, and then if I'm like um, saying something, like he's eating, he wants more. Um, and he's like looking, for, he's like, he wants juice. Or even if he's looking for something, he's like, hmm, like that. Like, and uh, and so many other things he can communicate. And so Khalil is this one-year-old baby who still can't speak with his mouth, yet he can completely communicate with us through, through sign language, which by the way, Zachariah at the age of two couldn't communicate at all. So like, we're so grateful that he's almost like, through Zachariah, through Khalil observing Zachariah, he's learned sign language himself, albeit like very small amounts of it, like signals, I wouldn't even call it language, sign signals almost, um, but it allows us to communicate with Khalil so much easier, and allows Khalil to communicate with us, and, uh, and a child who can't even speak, so I know that was all very long-winded, but um, uh, there's, I, 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 I would urge anybody who's struggling to get their children to communicate, to, 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 to put them on sign language and, and see how quickly they can communicate. Not only how quickly, but they can communicate, in, like you said, in so much more depth as well. Subhanallah, I, I ask that Allah Azza wa Jal bless you and reward you and your wife because you've done a great service to your children there. Like there are lot, lots of parents who perhaps wouldn't be as resourceful as you guys and think about what what real solutions there might be for their children. So I mean, may Allah bless you guys for that. It's, it also makes me think, you know, obviously, perhaps we in, in England, for people who are brought up in Britain, perhaps in our culture, we don't use our hands so much when, when we're so, communicating com compared to other cultures. Like I wonder if perhaps these kind of speech and language issues that we diagnose in our English culture are as common among Italians or among other cultures where they are more encouraged to just use their hands more in their communication generally. I, I, I wonder that. I wonder if that is the case because it's speech and language. When, when we talk about it in terms of the development of our children, we kind of use it synonymously with communication. And perhaps we're doing a disservice to children like Zachariah when we do that because, you know, really as humans, we, we communicate in many, many more ways than that. So that's... um. Yeah, that's, even that's as, really as parents, point. perhaps like it was a reminder to us that we can be lazy as parents uh, and just use our tongue because that's tough for a child. Imagine like not understanding. Like, have you ever seen this video online, which is is on YouTube, and it's called something like uh, "This is what English sounds like to non-English speakers." Yeah, yeah, and it's an incredible video because it's it's a guy who clearly sounds like he's speaking English with an English accent, but you don't understand a word of what he's saying. And I'd urge anybody to watch that. And if 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 if, if you put yourself in the mind of a child, in the frame of a child, the child can see your lips moving, and that's and they can hear sounds. That's it. Like you cannot give them anything else to go by. And so actually, I think that perhaps it was quite a lazy way of us parenting, or me parenting at least. Um, I definitely wouldn't put my wife in the category of lazy parenting at all. Uh, but definitely maybe perhaps myself, like just speaking and and oh, Zach could do this do that and then all of a sudden when you're even like if you don't do sign language but like you said actually using your hands picking things up like would you like this and and sometimes i think one amazing piece of advice somebody gave me but i can't remember who they almost said like when you're speaking or uh, something like you know when you're speaking to a child like a child it almost kind of can feel patronizing but it's not patronizing because they were a child <laughs> so it's like it's saying things much more clearer and using your hands and actions is a good thing and um and i think uh i, I I'm, I'm happy that we've started that kind of now it's entirely let's, let's, 
Yeah, go on. I was just going to make one more point, and then we can we can move on with it. Yeah, probably like, should. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, but it's it's entirely dependent on your children. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, as you said, like children just develop at different ages. You know, like yeah. with, with, with my eldest Yusuf, like his school had real concerns about just his literacy and his reading and stuff generally. But like I, I don't know. I've experienced in in, in my life with myself you know, and, and lots of other people as well. Like they, they may struggle with something for a little while and then they just hit a point when they peak at, l later on. And, but now like, like Yusuf, his vocabulary is incredible. Allah Mubarak, like, but, but it's, it's not the case yet with his younger brother, Yunus, but like Yusuf is because, perhaps because he's been used to communicating from when, when he was mu from, you know, when he was much younger, perhaps that's helped him, but, but we'll, we'll move on inshallah. So I think in the sort of, in the linear narrative of it, we got to a point where we were sort of in the marriage game. I mentioned <laughs> that I was a primary school teacher, um, but yeah. I, I, I married my wife at about the same time. Like I, I've been teaching, I've been teaching for about two weeks, I think. And then we just got okay. married in the, over the weekend <laughs> when, um, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. When, um, yeah, when I'd been teaching and the, the, the amount of time between, like when I found out that my wife was a human on earth to when she was my wife was about four months, I think. Like, alhamdulillah, Amazing. her family, her family made it very, very easy for us. May Allah bless them. They, they, um, I think my wife was maybe proud that she'd found um, a Nina Adan, a white guy to, for Hoyo who could speak Somali. I think maybe she was proud of that, but it was, um, it was done smoothly for us, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. I think, um, yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. May, may Allah bless them for that. So, um, I mean yeah yeah alhamdulillah so i mean I, I only taught in a primary school for about six months um frankly as i mentioned to you i just wasn't very good at my job <laughs> like, like being which a, is hard to believe because you're, you're you're an incredible communicator you're a linguist and you're very friendly so it's very difficult to believe but i'll believe you because you're also an honest man so but the, <laughs> now. But the thing is right is that in this country in some schools being a primary school teacher the teaching part is only a small part of your responsibility sure. Sure. um like i like throughout the day i was maybe at work 11 hours sometimes and only maybe six of those are actually with my students in in the class like others are um your actual job is plan mark assess so you're you're doing lots of planning and lots of assessing lots of marking of all of the books and when you're a primary school teacher and you teach maths and english and science and topics and a language and everything you've got so many books to mark and so much admin to do it should the job should really be general admin monkey who teaches sometimes that, that would be a more accurate title but anyway um, yeah, it, it didn't work out. There was there was another complication with me wanting to pray Juma as well. The school didn't take kindly to that, but partly because the school day for the younger children doesn't means your lunch break doesn't really overlap with Juma. Sure, and, sure. Um, yeah, and with with the I, yeah, I, I got a place on on a, a fairly good graduate graduate program here in the UK, and I, I told them from the very beginning that the Salah was a non negotiable for me. And um, it took them a very long time to find a school that had enough Muslims that might actually entertain the idea of me praying Jumar ah on Fridays. And um, but it turned out that it, it wasn't the case. So there was a number of reasons why it didn't really work out. And um, and that that was when I left and started teaching Arabic. And that was that was kind of terrifying because my wife had also um, was also pregnant at this point, like when I when I left that job. And I, you know, usually most it would be most people would assume that you would think okay i've got a wife and a and a baby on the way i should keep keep the stable job but in my mind i was thinking what trajectory for my family am i setting up it was, was so was similar more... i can't believe it <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> so many parts of my story that i just want to like <laughs> jump in but i'm not gonna but it's just subhanallah. Incredible similar, yeah. <laughs> subhanallah yeah well so but i mean that in the beginning was really just me i didn't know anything about youtube at this point or about setting up a podcast or about i didn't know anything about any of that i knew it was cool like I, i'd seen youtubers making money by being at home and making videos and stuff and i, I knew <laughs> that that was cool and i knew that there there must be a benefit to being able to make money um, on the internet, which can always sell things, even when you're like asleep and stuff. I, I knew yeah. there was a benefit to that, but I didn't know how it would work for me though. So I just started like tutoring Arabic to like kids. I just like started like just doing whatever I could to earn a bit of money to. Where are you living these days? In those um, days? Um, I was living in London at that point. So I was okay. teaching in East London, left, and then I was, I was still, still in East London. And sure. honestly, in the time that I've been teaching at that primary school, I, I developed such a love for those children. Like I had a class of like 32, 32 kids. And obviously you're with them. That's every humongous. Day. Is that normal? Uh, he, what, th they stitched me up with this class that was like 32 kids, 26 of them boys. Okay. In, the, in, in this class. Okay. Um, I think 50% of the kids in my class, English wasn't their first language. 
And um, and I had the class that like if I told other teachers in the staff room, oh, I teach this class, they'd sort of wince. They'd be like, oh, not that class. <laughs> so, Bro, is it, so I can't. So, it, but nowadays, as in like in twenty twenty two. In the UK, do can is it? Do they teach classes that are thirty-two kids in in a class? Is that possible? Oh, it's the, yeah, it is, but it's at the very top end. Like okay. ideally, you don't go over thirty. Ideally, right? No, but, but thirty still got, sounds so so many. It's a so big much. class. It's a really big class. It's a really big class. But but anyway, like I the the, the kids mm. in my class, like they'll be in year ten now. Subhanallah, I can't believe how how big they are now. But but anyway, like I remember, I was it was kind of a tragedy that I'd lost that job in a way. Like my whole life up to that point, it always gone the way I expected it was like two years of GCSEs and then two years of A levels mm -hmm. and then gone to the degree and you go through these phases of your life and I I thought that I just would have those phases of my life until I didn't and um I remember driving past that school to um to go and like teach kids whose houses I was going to and being so angry that when I started my job as a primary school teacher I chose a classroom on the other side of the building because I just wanted to see the kids work on the window I wanted to see like what the children had been painting and draw, drawing and stuff. I, I remember that so well, like driving past the school and thinking, why, yeah. why can I have just chosen a, anyway, anyway. So I, I love those kids anyway, but, but left to start teaching Arabic. And it was, it was in those houses around East London, teaching those children. When I started to put together what is now the Arabic in 60 steps program, like it was those lesson plans that kind of became what is now, now my Arabic program. Um, but it took a long time for it to, it to become that um, for a long time. It was just me teaching kids, um, you know, in their houses. And, but my, my career went online when I had to move back to Cornwall. Like, frankly, I just couldn't afford to live in London anymore. That was it. Like we just had a financial hardship really as, as is the case with lots of people. Like I, I don't, there's many people who start anything on their own and don't experience some, some kind of hardship financially. But, um, so we moved to Cornwall and obviously that gave me the benefit of moving all the work I had from London online. And that kind of started me creating videos and creating resources online for those students. And, and eventually I, I let go of teaching children because, um, yeah, I just, I, I realized that I could just communicate with and better serve adults generally. And just with the, the, the medium of the internet, I think, um, you need to be, really know what you're doing to teach children online. It's, um, you know, children, children just learn in a far more organic manner generally, I would say. And, um, I, I only really taught children because I came from a primary school teaching background and thought yeah. that I should should teach children, but but that that really wasn't 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 where I was best suited, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and that that was when I was Arabic with Sam, right? Like I I just started. I, I probably had a few other brands, like I probably started a few other channels that were just awful and you know <laughs> not, not not really thought through properly. I like Arabic stuff, with but... Sam. Sam. That's quite cool. <laughs> It just it tells you what it is, isn't it? There's no confusion about what it is. Unless you, know? you shorten it to AWS, and then you got a bit of you uh, might get a lawsuit. Well, yeah, yeah, my, yeah, I might just billion. get myself a lawsuit. Yeah. yeah, maybe, but but yeah, so there was Arabic with Sam for a long time, and it was kind of, it was maybe before that actually when I was Sam of Somalia. Like that channel, that channel was actually originally an Arabic channel, but I started creating videos about learning the Somali language on that channel. Um, yeah, just because obviously I'd married into a Somali family, and I saw so much merit in how interesting it was to document a process of learning something. Yeah. Like as an Ara Arabic teacher, it was like, I've learned sort of this stuff. I've got like a degree in the Arabic language and I'm teaching what I've learned. But the Somali stuff was all like, oh, I've learned this from my mother-in-law this week. And I'm just kind of sharing what, what I was learning. And that, that was really, that was really cool. Like that kind of, that channel, although it, although it doesn't make money and it, it isn't like a, it isn't a business. It gave me, it gave me belief that I had some level of talent, at least like some ability to create content that people actually wanted to listen to. And um, so it, it brought a massive amount of value to, to, to my life throughout that time. Like, cause there's, when you're making no money and everything, you, you need something, do you know what I mean? And at least there was an yeah. audience who, who followed my, who followed my content. And at least there were, there were, there were really big Somali platforms, may Allah bless them and reward them who reached out to me and hosted me on their platforms and stuff. And yeah, had, we had a lot of fun with that, but, but yes, yeah, just just. I, I think you're right. Like so much, so much of, so much of what you create, like it leads to, the issue of confidence, and once you get that boost of confidence, then you carry on in, in doing those things, and in this society and in this world, I feel like there's a hundred things trying to destroy a person's confidence, and it's very rare you find people or things boosting your confidence, and so you really have to be that like flag waver for yourself and try and f 
hang on to anything that boosts your confidence because it's only be- through people's insecurities that they try and break your confidence down. It's very easy for someone to go, oh, look at this guy, like white guy trying to learn Somali. Like that's hilarious. What a meme. And um, there'll be like hundreds of people wanting to there because they're insecure about learning new languages. They're insecure about like stepping out of your comfort zone. And it's when you see that those people who are championing your channel, uh, when you see that kind of reaction, it's important to to, 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 to take confidence from that. Um, you mentioned uh, the channel, uh, uh, the channel kind of like being popular, right? I remember I created this video, and it was the most popular video of my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel was, isn't and wasn't huge, and uh, so for me to get like a couple hundred thousand views, I think, or like even a hundred thousand views is like massive, right? And um, so I did this video, and it got like a hundred thousand views. It's like my most viewed video. It's uh, it's not public anymore. But it was called Learning to Speak Somali. And it was, it was when I had a, uh, I went out with one of my Somali friends and we did this segment when I asked him to sp- teach me words in Somali. And it was amazing. Like he just went, it like flew in the in the views and stuff like that. And it was a lot of positive feedback from the Somali community. And I'm glad I didn't like offend anyone and like treat it like a joke because I didn't mean to. And I think that's eventually why I ended, did end up taking it down. Not because anybody felt offended by it at all. But I think like as you grow, when you live your life online, I think you go through these phases where you grow and you're like, I don't want to be necessarily, um, I don't want personality to be like seen like that online or like that online. Like I think I've had a few people comments from people who say that perhaps I was more like, uh, light hearted before and, 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 and they would love to see that kind of content. I'd love to display that content, but it just, I would have to find like the right way of doing it because I still have that side in my private life with my family, but you learn that you want to be taken seriously in life as well. And, you know, um, as you go through your journey, I want to one day be a half of the Quran. And I think that it's not befitting for someone who is holding such a, the most important book in the, in the world, in their kind of, hopefully in their heart to also be like super like, jokey all the time and stuff so it's like having that balance and trying to figure out those things as you go and grow uh all that to say that my most popular video was learning to speak somali yeah no i i I 100 agree with you i mean perhaps i would say firstly may allah bless the somali people how encouraging they are to non-somalis learning their language i would i would definitely i would firstly i would definitely say that because there there are a number of people out there who have kind of in, in the public space, they are learning learning the Somali language and the, the the positivity is immense. And also just generally, our Somali brothers and sisters, may Allah bless them, they are prolific sharers of content about their culture. Like they're yeah. people who, may Allah bless them, they, they're, they're still very close to their country. Like I, I don't know if you, we kind of have different generations of, of, of Muslims moving from Muslim majority countries. They're perhaps like the Somali brothers and sisters that are like our age they're probably closer to maybe like what your parents' generation of Pakistanis and Bangladeshis were like, because they're like the first generation, the kind of, maybe right. their parents got married from, from back home and all that stuff. And so they're, I don't know, things about their culture and stuff shares very well. But I don't know, I've made a video recently about, it's perhaps a shame that Somalis maybe don't encourage Somali people who have maybe forgotten their language or aren't so strong in the Somali language the same way that they would me. Because believe me, I make some videos where I speak Somali in a video and it's awful. Like by a Somali standard, it's just terrible, right? If a Somali person spoke like that in another video, they would just, they would get destroyed. They, right. they would be told, they would be told Dakan Ellis is their only option, right? Being sent back to Somali is their only option, right? Like, but I get all this positivity and stuff. But I'm anyway, I don't know. It, I, 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 well, yeah, you still take it. I'm not, I'm not saying yeah. don't, don't be, don't be good to the non-Somalis. Who yeah. Somali, but I, I, don't, I don't know if you've experienced that with like, anybody like other Pakistanis you might know who maybe don't speak very good Urdu. Like one of my best friends is a Pakistani. Um, obviously, obviously you're one of my best friends now as well. Yeah, but, yeah, but so another, an- another friend. When, I, who, when uh, you say you want to be best with Pakistan, I'm assuming you're talking about me. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, well, one, one, one of my best friends who's a, who's a Pakistani has told me like when he's been trying to sharpen his Urdu, the response that he's, people just laugh at him. And yeah. It's so, so sad. Yeah, like, <laughs> so I, I have the same experience where, I we, our mother tongue is Punjabi. We got raised in Punjabi, and uh, but everybody around us spoke Urdu because um, uh, you're Pakistani, right? And so, uh, although in our house we spoke Punjabi, 
there's this like beautiful thing about Punjabi is that when you know Punjabi, you can speak. Well, I don't know. This might be a controversial thing to say, but I think it's true, right? So I'm going to say it. When you can speak Punjabi, you can quite easily speak Urdu. But I don't think the reverse is true. I think Punjabi is quite a difficult language to learn. So if you speak Urdu, you, I don't think you can necessarily get away with Punjabi. And I think that's true. And so um, Punjabi first language and Urdu are ba basically fluent, although, yeah, not... Uh, like anyone who's like actually Pakistani would laugh at me, right? And so they do and they have laughed at me. I think the only thing that's kept me going is for some reason, I just have this confidence in Urdu. I'm like, I don't care. Like, and I'll like, not only will I laugh with them or not, not, not laugh with them, but like it won't affect me which is weird because normally these things do affect me. But for some reason, <laughs> Allah's given me this like unwavering confidence with like speaking my mother tongue aggressively if I want to, and like just making mistakes and be like, I don't care that I'm making a mistake. Whereas in other languages, like Arabic, has been spoke. I feel like I was speaking to the Imam the other day, and I was like, we we're talking about the scooter, right? <laughs> and I was like, I was trying to say like, oh, it's. It's, it wasn't the it wasn't the most expensive scooter or something like that because he was saying oh like it stopped working at this point, and I was like, here uh, I was like, and I looked at him I was like, here oh hua and he was like, hadi uh, and I was like, I don't I, I like I stopped myself with those things I'm like, uh, I, whereas in Urdu I don't I like call something masculine even if it's even if I'm it's meant to be and it's only I think when you have that confidence that is when you actually learn and so I wish and I hope that I can gain that confidence with Arabic. Mm. Let's, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's carry on the story. Uh and um we're at a point now where you s for some reason said that you moved back to Cornwall because you've taken everything back online. Why did that happen and then when did you end up getting back out of Cornwall then? Or do you just mean that you'd visit Cornwall? No, no. I London's expensive to live in if you're not from London, right? Sure. Um yeah, so, so you moved back with a wife and the uh, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move, move with my wife and with my children. Yeah, and you, like, it was a necessity at that point. Like, I needed to make a decision as the emir of my family, really, to be somewhere that we could afford and we could look at look at rebuilding. And it's it's not a bad move for the safety of your children and stuff. It's beautiful. Like my my son y Yusuf, obviously, he was a newborn at that point. Like, we took him to the beach every day. Like, amazing. You know, it was, we we had a, we have a big garden and stuff. Like, things are just more spacious and and really lovely for children in lots of ways. But my my wife really had to um had to really have a lot of tawakkul in that time and really trust in me because it's it's difficult to go back to a little fishing village when she's a S Somali woman, you know, <laughs> like fully like abaya clad uh, Somali woman being like, you know, most of the people, uh, she might be the first Somali person ever to go to that village. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if she might be, you know, but yeah. So, but we weren't there for very long. We, we kind of made a compromise. We moved to Northampton for a little while because that's obviously where I was born and, and I knew that place fairly well. And there's a, de a decent Muslim community there. I don't know if you've ever been to Northampton, but it's a, it's a place that I really love. There's a, a fairly decent Muslim community and quite a lot of Somalis as well. Yeah, the, the masjid that I went to, I live just around the corner from a, a masjid with a, um, a big Somali community there. So we, we lived in Northampton for like a year and a half maybe. And um, yeah, and then we had an opportunity to to move back to London at that point. But we've moved so much, Echi. Like we, we've been married for about eight years now. And we've probably moved eight times, but we're we're, we're getting settled now, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but Alhamdulillah. it's just um, yeah, it's just that 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 situation really. But throughout all of these moves, it's for me, it's really just business of trying to trying to build something online that can benefit the Muslims and also provide our family with what we need. That's, that's what it was. It was, it was, it was Northampton really that gave me the stability to, to record the Arabic in 60 steps program, to write the workbook that goes with the program, to set up the support network for all the students and stuff. It was, it was that time when I was able to have the stability and the, be able to put in the hard work to make all of that happen. And that's, that's when that really became my bread and butter like the Arabic in 60 steps program. And it was probably when I made the change from being, Arabic with Sam to being the Arabic in 60 steps program. Cause I, I wanted people to know that there is a program behind this. And, and I think, and I mentioned to you previously as well, I, I was kind of uncomfortable with having like two personal brands. Like I was kind of uncomfortable with it, having like Sam of Somalia and Arabic with Sam, you know, like it's most I mean, people. My, know uh, we haven't had a chance to dive into your socials, but my uh, opinion, and it's just an opinion is that you should just stick to Samba. That should be your one, instagram channel everything goes there and and you have in your bio that there's an arabic with six seconds program that you're um uh, and you could write in one line like from cornwall like a studied arabic studied somali um 
love sign language and your whole and 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 there'll be no issue of clarity because I th- I feel like the reason you did Arabic sixty steps change in your profile is because of the clarity aspect right and um perhaps at that time that was important because uh, social media and the way people use it tends to differ but i think we're now coming to a point with social media where um all of the noise and people trying to figure it out is stopping and it's all leveling out now and it's like one like um very calm level which is hey here's me i'm a person and here's everything that comes with me and you can you can visit that here and um and that doesn't take away from all the uh, people and and people are really always attached to personalities at the end of the day Arabic with 60 seconds is taught by yourself and so um there seems to be less and less of a reason for brands to have pages almost because unless it, like Instagram and social media don't necessarily work well for announcements anymore they're like uh and, and maybe that will change but maybe there needs to maybe I, I suppose Twitter is that kind of place isn't it so it makes sense for like st- Arabic within 60 seconds have a Twitter page, but then it would be completely normal for it to go with your page. But we can talk about that after. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Just, just to speak to her very quickly, I, I, I actually, I own sammartinburr.com and I own at sammartinburr on, on almost every platform, right? Including some of the new weird ones. But, um, you know, the, so that I absolutely agree with you on many platforms, right? But there's some platforms where the algorithm has a massive impact on your success. And in the past, when I've tried to have everything on one platform, the algorithm just doesn't know where to put me. That does it want to show me to Muslims who want to learn Arabic, which would include people of any background or, or does it want to show me to people who want to see a funny white person say a few phrases in Somali? Like it's so that I, I, I agree with you. And it also makes it, it also makes my work much more streamlined and effective to have one platform where I just put everything. Like I absolutely see the merit to that. Yeah. But it's probably a very boring thing for us to talk about in front of an audience who may. Yeah, we'll take this off. Li- we'll take this offline, people. as they say in yeah, the in exactly. the world of work. Shut <laughs> shut um, okay, yeah, shut uh, well, let's come to uh, let's come to a um, let's come to a kind of like a, a circling off of this story because it's an incredibly interesting story. I think it will take a couple episodes to get through it, but. Um, um, you were not in uh, Cornwall for long. You've gone to Northampton, and there's quite a big shift that happens from that point, isn't there? Um, I don't know how much of it you want to talk about on the podcast, so I, I'll, I'll leave it open to you, and, and you you tell us what you want us to know. And um, but but yeah, so 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 you're in Northampton at, at this point. I suppose you have both both kids now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool. Eunice, Eunice was born when we were living in Northampton. Yeah, so, amazing. Um, yeah, so yeah, y- Yusuf and Eunice both born at this point, and. Um, yeah, we yeah we as I say we we came back to London, but um, yeah the the next point really is so some things have changed I think in the UK. Perhaps I I think the, the just the difficulty for us Muslims to practice our Islam in the West has maybe changed, or perhaps I so yeah. seeing my children get a bit older, I I feel a bit more of a of a pressure to have them um, in a in a Muslim majority environment. But I I don't know if it's a I don't know if it's just with me getting a little bit older. I I think that there's a big benefit to Muslims being in Muslim majority places, I think. And it's, it's perhaps the reason why I, why I like to remind, um, remind Muslims to encourage people to learn their own kind of back home languages, like to encourage other Pakistanis to learn Punjabi or Urdu and learn, encourage Somali so that they can go home, so that, so that, they, can, so that they can go back to their country. Or well, at least that they have that, op- that option, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have that option. I mean, that's, um, you know, that's the most diplomatic, but that's the most light and most diplomatic way of putting it. But I I think that I I, I personally, (laughs) no, no, I'm I'm not saying go home. Um, I'm not saying go home, (laughs) but I, 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 but I think it's, it's good to have the option and perhaps it, Perhaps it will be favourable at some point for you. Yeah, no, it's I, it's, I, 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 no, I'd agree that it's favourable now. I, I, I think what, what I was saying is, is that um, I wasn't. Uh, what I was saying is that the opposite is true. If you don't know the language, is that if you don't know yeah. language, it's it's like you can't go. Not you can't go, but it makes it so much more difficult, doesn't it? It like adds this huge yeah. barrier. So it's like always having that option is a positive thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, so, probably, especially so, now, I don't know how it works, but I've heard about like oh, apparently like citizenships can be just taken away and all this kind of stuff that's been going on. I, I mean, it probably is worth getting clarification on all that, but it's a very scary world we live in right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. There's there's just some madness out there. There's there, there's just some madnesses, right? And um and also I 
I believe in just supporting Muslim majority countries. I believe in spending your money in their economies. I, yep, yep, I believe yep. in, in, in in being there. Like be, being and existing there is 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 in a sense a a, a pledging an allegiance to a sense in, in a sense, right? Being there is a support of it. So um, so my wife and I sat down to have a difficult conversation about. Um, where can we go? Because we we both kind of agreed a lot. A lot of the time, it's kind of one of the spouses doesn't want to move to another country, and the other one yeah. does, and that's that's a big that's a big test for lots of people out there. Sure. But my my wife and I were completely aligned on that, and um, you know, we thought about some of the more obvious places like you know, Turkey is obviously much more accessible. That's something that I I like the idea of for a long time, and. Um, you know, it's, it's a place that my family could very easily come visit me. You know, yeah, my, my yeah, mum and dad yeah, yeah. go on holidays to Turkey all the time. My mum and dad do. My brother's been there and stuff. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what I, I think it came to the point where because we love our family so much and my wife comes from a, from a big family and they're really hands on, like the aunties and uncles of my children are, are, are really, really hands on. And, you know, they're amazing. Allah Mabarak, those guys. We we wanted to be around our family and, and I wanted to speak Somali more that, that we made we made the decision to start building a base for ourselves in Somalia and um that took a lot of planning you know yeah, that, I can that, imagine. that that took yeah that took a lot of planning and, and and also coming from a family like mine or from a little fishing village in in Cornwall like my mom you know may Allah make it easy for her my mom like when she gave birth to me she probably did not think that this boy is gonna is gonna become a Muslim and then Living go study in, in Somalia and, and, and then go to Palestine and then get married to a Somali woman and um and have children called Yusuf and Yunus and then move to Somalia. <laughs> so, yeah. So how, how, how has your, did you have you brought your because obviously you're in Cornwall right now were you, were yeah. you able to bring your kids with you? Uh, no, because it's only me okay. who has an issue with my visa. Um, it's only me oh, is that why you have to go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something. Inshallah, will be ironed out very easily. Um, I thought yeah, you had inshallah. to go for, uh, work, for, for some work or something. No, oh, there, there is another issue with them. Um, maybe you don't have this in Dubai, actually, but in Somalia, it's very difficult to get kind of work equipment, like things like a microphone and, sure, and stuff sure. like that. Like it's it's not easy to get um, to, to get some of those things. Or, or you can get them, but it will be a thousand dollars or whatever yeah. like because because yeah. of just import import rules and stuff like yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. so so with many of those things it's actually cheaper to visit your family at home to do some things that you want and do a big do amazon a shop and then, yeah yeah do it yeah exactly do a massive amazon shop and take the stuff that you need so um, we have yeah, a similar so kind of situation moment. like my dad my my dad and my sisters are going to be visiting me this week actually they're flying out tomorrow i'm really excited okay. and so I've, I've done a little amazon shop because even certain things like if if you if they're coming anyway it will it will save 20 30 quid per item sometimes uh yeah. to just get it ordered from home so uh, the the good thing here is that things are quite accessible uh i don't think i think it's gonna take a long time for anyone to beat like the uk amazon i imagine it's like this in america as well where amazon is just phenomenal in the uk like i appreciate it so much right now you can just order something it's then a couple of hours and it's anything you can imagine uh but but it is quite good here it's quite good uh but definitely Pri there's a, there's quite a big difference in the price quite yeah definitely difference. definitely like uh, like you know I, as as i start to become more public and stuff with with my life in somalia there'll be lots of these kinds of insights that i can offer people for sure yeah yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's just um it's so beautiful like i i love i truly love our home in somalia like if it wasn't for my visa issue i wouldn't have come back like i i, I really love mogadishu it's a it's a, just a beautiful city like i I really, I really ask that Allah Azza wa Jal reinstate it as a city that its people want to come home to. And um, um, oh, yeah, when are you so going to go back? Some, some, sorry. When are you going to go back to Somalia? Oh, a, a couple of weeks. I'm going to go back with my father-in-law. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I'm only waiting. Waiting. Are you able to? As you can't just kind of dip, dip out and dip back in. Um, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a bigger issue that you're dealing with, basically. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but it's more because I, I would rather fly with an. I'd rather arrive with a Somali family member. I suppose that's um that's, and that's also the thing. also um it's been nice to see your your family now that you're obviously of course in Korea. of course and also like they were terrified for me the first time yeah. I went <laughs> like my, like my dad and my mum and stuff like what they thought was going on when I left and everything but for me just to be back for a couple well, of weeks what's amazing you know? is that they never stopped you like they uh, that's uh, I I think really um it speaks volumes about the character of your family and your parents that though they may not understand it, it seems like a common theme within your life has been here's sam um, making these like what seems like such crazy decisions and very one could um maybe even if they were looking at it through the wrong lens argue erratic decisions and 
And your parents are probably the only people who have every right to say, uh, to have an intervention and say, Sam, you're not doing this. Multiple times in your life, when you became Muslim, when you um, uh, went to study, when you went to uh, Palestine, when you got married, when you went to... But it, it seems like a very common theme that your parents, may Allah bless them and may Allah guide them if they're not Muslim, had always... Uh, had that opportunity and chosen not to take it and chosen to trust in you and I can only imagine that that would actually increase your love for them it's incredible to hear because as a parent myself I'm sure you as a parent I worry about my children when they do like way less uh, crazy things and um, you you do feel an urge to to go no I know best now I'm gonna I'm gonna say something here and it sounds like your parents have chosen to let you learn through your own journey which is incredible they definitely they definitely trust my decision making and they res they they you know this is another thing that goes back to them being very um very kind of conservative and traditional in their values they they believe in the authority of the husband and the father to make decisions for their family like they they believe in that and like so a real value that i really hold i'm, I'm glad that this has come around to this for, for me to share this with you that a value that i really hold is keeping the main thing the main thing like sometimes the main most important thing right let's say for example with me studying arabic i wanted to go to the best place to learn arabic believe me i don't love london i'm not a city person but the main thing was go to the best place to learn Arabic and develop as a Muslim. We're going to London. Like it got to a point where it was like, okay, like I, I wanted to get married, but there's there's um, there's a woman that Allah has brought brought into my life, and there will be a challenge of learning sign language, of marrying into a big family, different culture, and all of this stuff. But the main thing is the main thing: marry a righteous woman. Like all the other things are just secondary. And even with this, like with with us, with our family having this journey with our new life in Somalia, like. Like, what is the main thing? The main thing is we put our children, we put our children in a, in a Muslim environment that is sustainable. Because I believe that if we had gone to somewhere else that is perhaps more obvious, like Turkey or Qatar or Dubai or even Egypt, right? I don't know if it would have been sustainable without like a family support network around us and other things like that. We wanted it to be long-term Muslim environment. It's not easy. It's good. There's going to be some security concerns. There, there's going to be some difficulties, but they keep the main thing, the main thing. And the other thing, and also when you're living in alignment with your values, like when you're living in a in a way which which is really congruent with what you want for yourself and your family, it's much easier to deal with kind of the secondary challenges. They're they're really like, you know, they're they're, they're things that are, are far easier to 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 overcome, you know. But but Mogadishu has provided something for me personally, like a it's like a it's like a final chapter of the book in a sense of of, of my life because like I've. I've, I've had this situation throughout my life where I've chosen to embrace Islam and that's my choice based on keeping the main thing, the main thing, pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. But I've also been raised by the seaside and I never found a place where I could marry those two things. Like living in Cornwall isn't a great environment for Muslims long term, right. For us to live, we don't have a big Muslim community. Getting halal food is, is a challenge. Right. But I've always wanted to be by the sea and more with the issue is those things. And then I've had this journey of living in these different places with my wife, like my wife and I trying to butt heads and figure out where we're going to live. And then of all places, it's Mogadishu for us <laughs> that, that has given us that peace and has brought those challenges that we've had throughout our lives into, into one place for us. So, um, so I suppose the point that I was making is as, as a value in my life, I, I believe in keeping the main thing, the main thing. And to answer your question about my parents trusting me in that is, They've, they've witnessed me do that throughout my life. Like I've demonstrated competence to them, I hope. And, um, and so even, even against their, even against what they would love in a selfish, selfish point of view. And they've, they, they have told me that in the past, like even when I wanted to go to Uganda, when I wanted to go to Uganda to go and do the Dawa out there, my, my dad had reservations about it. Like just who the people were that I was going with. Like he didn't really know who they were. And like, I'd met them through a message in Plymouth and things like that. And like, he told me, he was like, look, for selfish reasons, I don't want you to go. Not, I hate that you go. It's just that it's not what I want that you go. I want you at home with me this summer. You've just been in Palestine for a year. <laughs> like, I'd like you at home with me this summer. But but he, he told me at the time, he said, that's not the same as me saying you can't go. That's amazing. It's incredible, it's quite incredible part, uh, parenting and leadership as well. I hope they'll have the strength to say those have those kind of conversations and say those kind of things because I think that's where growth happens and 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 it's powerful conversations to have. So it's, it is incredible. Um, what's what what's uh, what does the future hold? 
the future for me is to serve the country that I'm a guest in, um, is to serve Somalia, really. Like, I, I really want to continue building the Arabic in 60 Steps program and, and serve my students. Like, a really big dream of mine in, in writing this program and everything has been that I will stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment, and there will be thousands of Muslims saying, I understood your speech, O oh Allah because of this program that this person wrote. Or like, I got a little bit closer to your beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because this program that this person wrote. Like, I, I have a really strong why with, with the Arabic in 60 Steps program, but but I'd really love to. Like when I'm when I'm by myself or when I'm talking to myself in the mirror about the man that I want to be, like, I, I really would love to start a company or something that pays people in Somalia, that contributes something to the economy, that that um that just does something that's for those people not not something that i take profit from or that's kind of a big business in a corporate sense but something that um that contributes and serves that that place cuz i don't know so sometimes because of the name of the brand sam of somalia people jump to a conclusion that like i think i'm somali somehow or, or like or that i'm trying to be somali like it's it's none of that like i'm entirely at peace that allah has put me in a position where i'm a guest in a country that's hosting me and I'm learning their language. And as, as a guest in that country, I've, I feel like as, as Muslims, these identity, these issues of identity have actually made very simple for us. Like you should entirely be at peace being someone who's a stranger in a land, but, but, but just as a Muslim, like you're kind of at, at home as a Muslim, if you know what I mean. That's very true. Um, I often, you know. I, I've often said here that I, people have asked me about, um, being here and people ask very you can the, the the obvious stuff you can imagine one of the things i often say is that I, I, kind of for the first time i don't feel like a guest in my own religion because but so so we just went to the hospital we, we started recording this podcast a bit late because um i had to take exactly to the hospital and it's little things like maghrib came in i'm in a hospital right and in I, I literally just I so I couldn't go to the prayer room. I was with Zechariah. He was waiting for his name to be called. Even the fact that there's a prayer like I guess there's prayer rooms in all the hospitals actually. But um the fact that what happened is is I just stood up and I prayed in the waiting room. And I and and even if, if people might say you can do that anywhere and you can do that anywhere. If you have enough confidence you can do that anywhere. But the khushur is quite hard to achieve when i've prayed like on the street in in england when i've got nowhere to go and it's maghrib and you've got to get out of your car get your prayer mat i just pray on the street but there's no denying that the khushur is tough when there's someone walking past walking their dog and you just think like oh man like either what is they what are they thinking or who's the person are they crazy and stuff like that and when you're in a when you're in a majority muslim country and you stand up and you pray you don't feel like a guest in your religion because you feel like if anything, people will look at you and go, oh, like, that's a reminder I have to pray. Or or like if you if a non-Muslim saw you, they wouldn't, they would, it's like, they would feel, they've, I've never had a, the, like, for, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you know when you go to the masjid here and you see, you, you, you I, I live in an area that there's, quite a few non-muslims and even in this area there's two masajid within like um 2000 steps and i, I say it in steps because I, I calculate my steps like going to the rest of it. but like that 2000 steps means it's i don't know a 15 second drive like it's very close to masajid right and it's like a, uh, and you you see non-muslims walking past the mosque when it's salah time and the 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 adhan is going on and they don't ever look bewildered or weirded out by it they've accepted it is my point. And so because of that, I don't feel like a guest, like, oh no, I need to be conscious or I need to pray. I need to be conscious that like, oh yeah, they're, like, what are these guys thinking? It's like, no, like I'm in a Muslim land and I'm going to pray and there's something comfortable about that. And uh, then we went to, I, you know, uh, the, the, then Zachary's name was called. We went uh, in to be consulted by a doctor and we're greeted by the doctor with, Asalaamu Alaikum. And we Zachary is being seen, and then the doctor says, "You know, um, yeah, it seems like a uh, the problem is this, and um, I can't see why it shouldn't just go away in a few days, inshallah." And it's like you just hearing the word inshallah by the doctor, like it's just so amazing and beautiful to hear. Like you just can't 
put an uh, put a, a word on that kind of feeling and just that kind of happiness and the fact that Zachariah himself is growing up in a, in a, in a world where he's seeing the doctor and the doctor is coming up to him and the first thing the doctor is doing is going salam alaikum and Zachariah is like shaking the doctor's hand saying wa alaikum salam like that is so like oh amazing alhamdulillah Allahumma barik Allah protect it subhanallah when i think about that if i if i compare that to like my experience living in in London as a teacher, like it's almost like my Islam was like my my dirty secret. It, in the that's workplace. what I'm saying. So like, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Yeah, why saying a guest? Yeah. Mm, subhanallah. Whereas, like you know, obviously, I had, like our situation in Somalia, like some Somalia, I mean, more, more so than many places, it's it's a hundred percent Muslim. Like, yeah. I mean, th there are there are foreigners who are working there and stuff. Like when when I was when I was leaving recently, I was in the airport. There's lots of Germans and Italians who are working there and stuff like that. Like there's there are there are non-Muslims who are there, but in terms of the culture among the Somali people, like and, and obviously you have variety and religiosity among people. Like that that's always course, been the yeah. case. That, that, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. something new. That's not something new. But even even though that is the case, even among people who aren't religious, they still have a respect that Islam is the default. Like they're, they're yes. no, nobody's nobody's going to look down on you and say you're out of place for exactly. performing wudu and and you know <laughs> and, and praying the salah. You know that's just that's just not the case. So it's yeah, you know, I think it's, I, it's, I suppose yeah. Well, I was getting at as well. Um, Sam, I have to unfortunately draw this episode to a close, which makes me sad because I've I've really enjoyed this episode, uh, and it's actually quite nice that it's been kind of it's been almost two hours, and um, it's been a long time. We've we've reduced the episodes um, since I moved out here because it's been a lot more effective getting them in, in in about an hour. But I'm glad this was a long one because I've enjoyed the conversation and I I wanted to get like the full story out of it, and I I always. I love these episodes when we get because we don't always have like story episodes where people tell their life stories often. And I equally love the episodes when a person who's done that comes on the next time because it's like that big elephant in the room has been discussed and it's like always really lovely to do that as well. And so I, I urge you to come on again in the future if you would accept the invitation. And 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 the fact that you're in the UK for a few weeks and you have this brand new shiny mic um, and you're away from your family, I'm going to probably drag you into a few episodes here and there if you don't mind. Uh, because we're planning, to, cool, we're, we're, we're planning to do a few episodes. We're planning to change up the content slightly with Fresh Kind and do a few episodes more regularly that are kind of like group episodes, like a few freshly grounded regulars um, just having a natter. So uh, I would love for you to be involved in some of those episodes. Would you do something in person one day if I was in Dubai or if I was course, if I was course, somewhere nearby? Would you do something in person? Yeah, yeah, maybe of course. I'd love that. That'd be I'd nice. Yeah, it'd be really, really nice. I'd love for you to meet Sheikh Muhammad Tim because um, he uh, also became Muslim at 40 and you became Muslim at 16, right? Did you become Muslim at 16? Um, so I actually took my Shahada at 17. It's more accurate Fine. to say 17, yeah. Oh, then forget it. No, you, you don't need to meet him. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> no, I want to I yeah. uh, meet the chef. So, so yeah, what's amazing is that um, he like is like all of us should be. He's like in love with the Arabic language as well, and so I think like you guys really get along well. So, um, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Sam. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Uh, I know you must be busy out there. You obviously you're seeing your family for the first time in ages, um, and so I do appreciate that. And I hope that we'll, we can have you on again soon in the future. Jazakallah khairan. It's been an absolute pleasure. So may Allah bless you, Akhir. May Allah bless your, your hard work and your platform. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to coming on again sometime. I mean, thank you. And, and just quickly before you go, so, uh, if people want to sign up to Arabic, uh, Arabic in 60 Steps, perhaps just let us know how and what exactly is that you teach over there. Yes, yeah, so you can go to Arabic in 60 Steps on any platform, really from, from TikTok to YouTube to my our podcast, um, you know, or just go to Arabic in 60 Steps.com and uh, you can join the program. It's a pretty comprehensive program that takes students from building their very first sentences right up to the end when our graduates are reading some really iconic Arabic texts. Like you know, our graduates are reading and discussing texts like classical Arabic poetry, some modern Arabic poetry, some of Arabic's travel writings, which is some literature that I really love. So um, it's a very kind of comprehensive program. Students get a workbook in the post that looks like this. Um, they get one of these physical workbooks with loads of exercises wow. and stuff in it. Um, there's also a WhatsApp number on this phone. Every single student on the program has access to the WhatsApp number on that phone that I have on my desk and answer students' questions every day. It's just a very comprehensive way to take yourself from being in the position where most Muslims are, where they already know Elif Ter, they already know the script to some degree. From that point, through Arabic's most common grammar and most frequent vocab in the Quran and in literature like that, all, um, all wrapped up in one pretty convenient program for you. 
Amazing. And now there's an, a really cool mic that you can use that will get that will be the kind of bass in their ears as well. So yeah, yeah. Glad to see that. Uh, all right, Sam. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair, and inshallah we catch up soon. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Barakallah. Barakallah. Wa alaikum assalam.